गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन वेलकम टू बाइट विद एग्जाम प्रेप सो आई होप दैट माय वॉइस एंड द वीडियो आर क्लियर इट इज एब्सोल्युटली ऑडिबल सो लेट मी चेक आल्सो yes so it is it is working fine so please share the session with all of your friends okay please share the session with all of your friends because today is very important session that is the maha marathon class for the communication system in one go so in the complete 8 uh, hours we are going to discuss the complete syllabus of all the concepts of communication system and uh, here you have to you know this is the day when you can revise the communication system completely from the starting to the end so we will plan according to that then uh, i have already uh, planned that how to proceed this eight hours and how to you know uh, cover your entire syllabus also so i am not uh, leaving any topic right now uh, as per the attendance of the students if the students will be continuing coming and if the more students will join then obviously i will not leave any topic and we will cover entire syllabus of the communication otherwise otherwise guys uh, if the attendance will not be good then i will be covering only important topics of communication because if you won't commit then i will also be you know feel demotivated that if i am taking eight hours of classes and if the students are not coming then what is the sense of taking eight hours in one stretch right so good morning manoj good morning pooja good morning bhaskar so yes come on guys quickly share the session to everybody and if you are coming first time in my session then this is a brief introduction about myself so this is saket verma and i am having more than 12 year experience in the field of gate and esc so that is why i can tell you which type of you know questions from the communication or the subject i deal with uh, can come and how to proceed with those subject so this is and the subjects i take is emt communication system advanced communication system signals and system etc so good morning good morning akash dreamer pankaj also so yes guys come on yes so it's very good to see that many of you are joining and still the people are joining yes good morning sai panit so i hope that all of you are preparing well for the gate examination so to boost your preparation we are coming with another series that is the master and sq series so that will be starting from the 17th of january when the marathon session will complete then we will start your msq series where you will get the msq question from each subject so that whatever will be the subject that you are looking for for each and every subject you will see the questions from uh, uh, msq questions from each subjects okay so that will be again very beneficial for all of you that will be again beneficial for all of you and after that you have an all india open mock test and it is running between 10 to 16 you can register yourself in the you know a uh, link is given in the description you can register yourself so let's start the communication with the basic which is the modulation yes good morning satyam so those who have already studied uh, from me you know learn the concept from me listen to me already uh, you are much familiar with the uh, modulation that the modulation is nothing but the the no modulation is nothing but the process in which we translate the low frequency signal into high frequency right we translate the low frequency signal into high frequency signal so first of all you have to understand why we perform the modulation so it is nothing but a frequency translation process where we translate the low frequency signal into high frequency there is another way of defining this particular part when you translate the low frequency signal into high frequency it actually converts the low pass signal into band pass okay so the low pass signal is converted into the band pass after modulation so low pass is converted into band pass after modulation 
okay so weightage uh, i would like to tell okay so that uh, one question coming from ayush that uh, sir please tell the weightage so let's discuss the weightage ones okay because this is also important for those who are preparing a communication now and uh, you know at the end if you are watching this session in the last 20 days so let me tell you the complete you know weightage of the subject so we have analog communication and in analog communication we have amplitude modulation right and we have the angle modulation where we discuss about the fm and pm so there will be definitely one questions from this topic okay so in the analog communication these two topics are very important and there will be definitely one question and it may up to the two questions so one or two question you can expect from this particular topic one one question from each chapter okay now there is a receiver part also here we have the receiver also super and receiver but uh, there is a less chance coming from question coming from this topic okay there is a less chance but uh, you know every three to four years there will be one basic question from the super and receiver so i am not uh, taking this super and receiver in this part uh, that is the gate 2023 it is not that much important according to me because the last year only they have covered the super and receiver so uh, 2021 they have asked the question so there is less chance that they will ask question again from the super and receiver very uh, you know uh, frequently now we have another chapter known as random variable and the random process so in the random variable and random process we have many concepts okay we have many concepts and uh, in this particular chapter we have the concepts like cdf and pdf right cdf and pdf then we talk about the central limit theorem here okay this is central limit theorem over here and uh, then we talk about uh, transformation right then we talk about the transformation of random variable so transformation of random variable and there is a minimum and maxima of random variables if you have more than two three random variables then how do you calculate the minimum and maximum of random variables so gaussian random variable obviously and random process may aapke paas a jayega auto correlation right auto correlation and cross correlation and power spectral density so all these are important topics and here you can expect the two questions again so from this topic you will see the maximum of two questions and the last one is which is very very important that is your digital communication so in the digital communication we have multiple chapters like pcm that is known as baseband transmission then you have digital modulation so this is the digital modulation and then we have the probability of error concept okay so the probability of error concepts and then you have information theory okay information theory and coding so there will be definitely two to three questions from this particular digital communication there will be two to three questions from this digital communication so overall the expected question number of question is five to six okay so five to six questions will be coming this year that is the expectation from the communication obviously in the last two years if i see the last two years that is gate 2021 and 2022 we had approximately 8 to 10 questions okay so that is approximately 8 to 10 questions in the subject but still i am expecting the minimum side 6 to 7 questions you can say that can come from the communication so i hope that ayush uh, weightage of the overall communication is clear to you now coming back to our discussion we are saying that if we are talking about the analog communication then we should first understand what is the modulation okay so the modulation is nothing but the frequency translation technique so it converts the low frequency signal into high frequency and we can also say that this low pass signal is converted into band pass signal this is the one 
way of defining the modulation there is another way that it is the process in which the characteristic of one waveform which is known as carrier is varied in accordance with the characteristics of another waveform so in the communication we will always have the two signals one is your message signal and another is your carrier signal the purpose of the carrier signal is to carry the message signal for a longer distance so if the characteristics of the carrier signal varies in accordance with the message signal then we will have the modulation process now which characteristics you are varying according to that we have amplitude modulation frequency modulation and phase modulation so there are number of you know uh, modulation techniques like amplitude frequency and phase all it depends on the characteristics of carrier so what are the carrier signals the carrier signal we define as ac cos omega ct plus pi this is how we can define so this is the amplitude of the carrier so if you vary the amplitude of the carrier according to your message signal which is known as modulating signal which is also known as baseband signal so it will be called as the amplitude modulation and if you uh, change the frequency then we call it as a frequency modulation if you change the phase then we call it as a phase modulation okay so in this way we have the three topics in the analog communication now the next question is how do we perform the modulation so to perform the modulation we actually multiply the two signals so the signal which is to be modulated suppose this message signal you want to modulate then you have to multiply it with the high frequency let us suppose fc so when you multiply the high frequency signal when it is only written as a uh, carrier frequency or fc or high frequency then you can assume it as a ac cos omega ct okay if only frequency is given in the input of any multiplier or any modulator then you can assume it as a sinusoidal signal so whenever you multiply the message signal with the sinusoidal signal okay whenever you multiply the message signal with the sinusoidal signal you get the shifted version because when you take the fourier transform so when you take the fourier transform this will be nothing but a ac upon 2 in bracket m of f minus fc it will be shifted to fc and m of f plus fc so this is how we draw the modulated signal so let us suppose this is our message signal this message signal is having the maximum frequency of 5 kilohertz and the minimum frequency of minus 5 kilohertz so what is the bandwidth of this m of f tell me what is the bandwidth of this m of t or m of f yes to akash tushar ayan yes so see still i, I was expecting one of uh, you will uh, give me answer as the 10 so that is what yes good morning tushar so that is what i wanted to see that uh, whether you have a uh, concept clear or not because the bandwidth is always calculated from the positive side okay the bandwidth is always calculated from the positive side and the bandwidth of this signal is 5 kilohertz okay so this is the bandwidth remember that bandwidth is doesn't mean that highest frequency minus lowest frequency so this is highest frequency and you will say this is lowest frequency so the bandwidth is 2 fm no bandwidth is highest frequency minus lowest frequency but that is calculated only from one side of the spectrum okay this is nothing but the highest frequency minus lowest frequency but only from the positive side only from positive side yes to shar art good morning okay so i hope kk and vanya it is clear to all of you that how do you calculate the bandwidth bandwidth is always calculated from the positive side of the spectrum okay only from positive side of spectrum now when we have multiplied with the carrier frequency 
when we have multiplied with the carrier frequency this mt and cos omega ct which is cos 2 pi fct it is given in the modulator so we have got the yt and as i told you that yt will be nothing but a mt into cos omega ct okay cos omega ct and the fourier transform of this will be m f m of f minus fc plus m of f plus fc divided by 2 that is the fourier transform okay this is y of f this is y of f yes imanshu good morning so now because uh, uh, it is shifted version and we have taken the carrier frequency as 1 megahertz okay we have taken the carrier frequency as 1 megahertz so okay we have taken the carrier frequency as 1 megahertz then it will shift towards 1 megahertz and 1 megahertz means this is m of f minus fc that is 1000 1 megahertz means 1000 and the message signal frequency was uh, 5 kilohertz so this is 1005 and 995 and uh, this is minus 1005 minus 1000 minus 995 so whenever you shift towards right you will get m of f minus fc and uh, this m of f minus fc the mirror image of the right hand side spectrum will be m of f plus fc means the spectrum which you will shift towards left is towards the left hand side and that is nothing but the mirror image of the right hand side so this is uh, 1 by 2 m of f minus fc and this is also 1 by 2 m of f plus fc so you can see the amplitude is 0 0.5 now it is centered to 1000 it is centered to 1000 so what is your bandwidth now what is your bandwidth now so the bandwidth is now highest frequency minus lowest frequency where the component exists so uh, you cannot say here the bandwidth is bandwidth is highest frequency minus lowest frequency so this is 1005 minus 0 so 1005 kilohertz that will be wrong okay that is wrong you cannot calculate the bandwidth like this bandwidth is always calculated where the component exists so uh, our spectrum exists our message signal or our information exists between 995 to 1005 so the bandwidth will be now 10 kilohertz right yes 10 kilohertz so this spectrum you can see is a bandpass signal okay this spectrum you can see is a bandpass signal okay so this is your bandpass signal and our message signal was low pass signal why we are calling it as a bandpass signal because it is centered at high frequency okay because this spectrum is centered at high frequency we are calling it as a bandpass signal and uh, this is our low pass signal because it was centered at this was low pass signal because it was centered at origin so the signal which is centered about low frequency or origin is known as low pass signal and the signal which is centered at high frequency is called as bandpass signal. So, this is the concept of modulation. So, why do we perform the modulation? Why do we perform the modulation? So, modulation is performed to reduce the height of antenna. Suppose we wish to transmit a 3 kilohertz signal through a hertz and dipole antenna, then we know that the height of antenna can be uh, this is not a hertz and dipole antenna this is a half wave dipole antenna actually so we should write half wave okay so this is half wave because we are using the lambda by 2 so half wave dipole antenna because the length is lambda by 2 so when we calculate the length we got the 50 kilometer so 50 kilometer is practically impossible to install a antenna of 50 kilometer height just to transmit the 3 kilohertz signal okay just to transmit 3 kilohertz signal it is not feasible to install 50 kilometer height antenna so what we do we perform the modulation and after performing the modulation 
okay after performing the modulation the signal is shifted to 3 megahertz like in the previous example we have seen that our low frequency was 5 kilohertz and after modulation it was centered to 1000 kilohertz okay that is after modulation right so similarly here uh, before modulation it was 3 kilohertz and now after modulation it is 3 kilohertz and after modulation it is 3 megahertz so when the signal is converted into 3 megahertz we got the lambda is equal to c upon f which is 100 meter wavelength and the height of the antenna is 50 meter which is practically realizable so obviously to reduce the height of antenna we do the modulation okay next uh, the second need we can say is there can be multiple requirement but i am just taking two or three example so the second is modulation increases the range of frequency or range of communication because the linear for the linear antenna radiated power is directly proportional to l upon lambda whole square so radiated power is directly proportional to square of frequency so when you increase the frequency the radiated power also got increased therefore the range of system got increased okay so what does it mean if you have the radiated power agar aapka radiated power bahut zyada hoga so you can transmit it through the channel and agar aap high power transmit karoge to it will take some time to get attenuated completely okay so it may be possible ki jahan tak aap bhejna chahte ho wahan tak pahunchte pahunchte uska power ek certain level tak hi reduce hoga aur aapka signal receive ho jayega but matlab ki aap usko large distance tak transmit kar sakte ho because it is taking too much time to reduce the power completely because the power has increased because we have increased the frequency so if you uh, transmit one watt of power then it will not uh, you know uh, travel for a longer distance but on the other hand if you will transmit one kilowatt of power then after attenuation it, it may be after attenuation it will be received as one watt but when uh, it will be received this one watt power when you transmit if you are transmitting for the long distance it may be possible that when you will receive it will be 0.1 watt or maybe very less that your your receiver cannot detect hai na ye aisa bhi ho sakta hai ki aapka receiver usko detect hi na kar paaye so that is why the modulation increases the range of communication next advantage is modulation overcomes the hardware limitation for practical hardware implementation fractional bandwidth is 10% 1 to 10% aapka hona chahiye fractional bandwidth what is the fractional bandwidth this is bandwidth divided by center frequency so when you increase the center frequency when you increase the center frequency uh, fractional bandwidth will reduce so increasing the center frequency means you are shifting towards the higher frequency so if this low frequency signal which is having the 5 kilohertz bandwidth and when you shift it towards 10 kilohertz and then when you calculate the fractional bandwidth okay when you will shift towards 10 kilohertz then when you calculate the fractional bandwidth what will be the fractional bandwidth so the bandwidth is 5 uh, when you shift it towards 10 so when you shift it towards 10 it will be 5 it will be 10 and it will be 15 so the bandwidth is 10 and the center frequency is also 10 so it will give you approximately 1% uh, sorry 1 that means 100% okay that is giving you 100% because we are calculating in the percentage no so it is 100% so fractional bandwidth is 100% fractional bandwidth is 100% if you shift the message signal with the carrier frequency of 10 kilohertz then your fractional bandwidth is 100% so obviously uh, it is not suitable for hardware implementation because we said that for hardware implementation the fractional bandwidth should lie in between 1 to 10% okay so on the other hand 
if i take the center frequency suppose 1000 that means suppose i take the carrier frequency as 1000 kilohertz that is 1 megahertz then for the same frequency the fractional bandwidth okay the percentage fractional bandwidth will be bandwidth is 10 only because when you will shift it okay when you will shift it it will be shifted towards 1000 and this will be 1005 and this will be 995 so in this case the bandwidth is 10 but the center frequency is now 1000 multiplied with 100 it will give you 1% so what you see when you increase the center frequency or when you increase the carrier frequency the fractional bandwidth comes down to the optimum range which is suitable for practical implementation ठीक है तो practical implementation के लिए ये वाला जो range है वो suitable है तो carrier frequency को increase करने से ये एक और advantage आपको मिलता है ठीक है चलो अब ये question आप solve करो solve this question I hope that this question is visible to all of you okay this question is if it is not visible then let me hide myself okay now see the question and solve it and tell me what is the answer you are getting Calculate and tell me what is the answer. So I hope that you have seen the question clearly. Okay. So we have a x1 t which is a rectangular 10 to power 4 t and we have x2 t which is delta t. We are transmitting it through the h1 f which is having the response as or transfer function as rectangular f upon 2 into 10 to the power 4. And the second one is having the rectangular f upon 10 to the power 4. And when we are multiplying these two, uh, we are getting the signal zt which is y1t and y2t. We want to calculate the bandwidth of zt. We want to calculate the bandwidth of zt. So, if I draw it, okay, if I suppose draw it, that is our x1t, then this is a rectangular pulse, okay, this is a rectangular pulse, what is the width? The width is, the width is 0 0.5 into 10 to the power minus 4 and 0 0.5 into 10 to the power minus 4, 
this is minus sign and the when amplitude is 1 this is your x1 t this is your x1 t okay what is the fourier transform of this what is the fourier transform of a rectangular pulse the fourier transform of a rectangular pulse is sync and it will have the zero crossing where in the inverse of width okay so this is the sync pulse so here we will see this is the height the width is 10 raised to power minus 4 so it will be 10 to the power 4 and it will be minus 10 raised to power 4 this will be 2 into 10 raised to power 4 okay and this will be minus 2 into 10 raised to power 4 so this is the zero crossing point okay so this is frequency in hertz this is a rectangular pulse x1 f oh, sorry sync pulse having the height equal to area of this rectangular pulse which is 10 to the power 4 minus 4 10 to the power minus 4 okay is it clear so this will be x1 f and because we are transmitting it through the rectangular f upon 2 into 10 to the power 4 what does it mean so it means that let me draw over here only this rectangular f upon 2 into 10 to the power 4 means it is having the width of 2 into 10 to the power 4. So, this is a low pass filter, right? So, this is 10 to the power 4 and this is with minus sign and this is plus 10 to the power 4. This is f in hertz. So, this is the transfer function of first block which is h1f that is upper block and the height is 1. So, when you will pass this x1f through that particular filter, only this part of the signal will pass okay only this part of the signal will pass because it will suppress the side loops it will suppress the side loops so after the filter okay so if i draw that after the h1f after the h1f we get we get only the main loop which is 10 to the power 4 and this is minus 10 raised to power 4 this is nothing but a y1 f this is nothing but a y1 f okay is it clear now we have x2 now we have x2 t so x2 t was impulse okay so this is x2 t this x2 t is impulse which is delta t so, delta t is this only impulse at t equal to 0, x to t is delta t and now it is passing through the rectangular f upon 10 raise to power 4. So, now the Fourier transform if I draw, the Fourier transform of this rectangular uh, impulse is 1, right. The Fourier transform of the impulse is 1. So, this is your x to f. So, this is 1, this is f. Clear? Now, you are transmitting it through the filter which is having the, what is that rectangular function? So, again if I draw the rectangular function which is related to H2F, then it will look like this. This is H2F. This is H2F. This is 10 to the power uh, 0 0.5 into 10 to power 4 and minus 0 0.5 into 10 to power 4 this is f so it will pass only the frequency which is less than 0 0.5 into 10 to power 4 so when you will pass it okay when you will pass it through the s2 of f we will get y2 of f Okay, and it will be minimum of 0 0.5 into 10 to the power 4 
and maximum of 0.5 into 10 to the power 4 and this will be 1 okay Now tell me what will be the bandwidth of y1 t into y2 t. Our aim was, our aim was to calculate the bandwidth of z t. So we want to calculate the z t bandwidth of z t, which is y1 t into y2 t. So our aim was to calculate the bandwidth of z t. Okay, so bandwidth of z t would be what is the bandwidth of ZT? Tell me. Yes. So, because they are multiplied in the time domain, okay, because they are multiplied in the time domain, they will get convolved in the frequency domain and in the frequency domain, when we perform the convolution, the Y1F and Y2F, okay, so suppose, if I perform the convolution of Y1F and Y2F, then the maximum value will be, the signal will be band limited to only, the signal will be band limited to 10 to the power 4 and sum of 10 to the power 4 and 0 0.5 into 10 to the power 4. So the bandwidth is, so the bandwidth is 10 to the power 4, the maximum frequency of the Y1F plus the maximum frequency of Y2F. So, this will become 15 kilohertz. So, the answer will be 15 kilohertz. Yes, so answer will be 15 kilohertz. Correct. Akash, Tushar and Chinmay. Yes. So, answer is 15 kilohertz. The maximum frequency of both the signal will be added together to get the maximum value. Okay. So, let's come to the next topic which is amplitude modulation. So now what is the amplitude modulation as I said that there are two definition of modulation. One is to convert the low frequency into high frequency that is known as frequency translation which also tells that the low pass signal converted into band pass and another is the characteristic of one waveform which is carrier should vary according to the characteristic of message signal or modulating signal keeping other parameter constant. So, here amplitude modulation we can define when we vary the amplitude of carrier according to the instantaneous value of message signal keeping the frequency and phase constant. Okay, so we have to vary only amplitude of carrier to get the amplitude modulated signal. So, how do we get when we give input as a message signal and the carrier signal to the block which is known as amplitude modulator which has some amplitude sensitivity which is Ka then we get the amplitude modulated signal at the output which is AM signal. Okay, so this is AM signal. So when you give message signal and the carrier signal to the input of amplitude modulator the expression of amplitude modulator you will get uh, okay the expression of AM signal you will get is S of t is equal to AC 1 plus K M T cos omega C T, where AC is the carrier amplitude, K is the amplitude sensitivity of modulator whose unit is volt inverse and the message signal will be having unit in volt and the carrier frequency is FC, where the AC 1 plus K M T is called envelope, where AC 1 plus K M T is called envelope of the signal, right?
Okay. So up to this point, it is clear to all of you. Yes. Now coming to the next part, how do we define the modulation index? Modulation index is how much how much modulating signal modulates the carrier wave. How much a modulating signal modulates the carrier wave is known as depth of modulation or modulation index. Modulation index is MA is equal to K into maximum value of MT. K into maximum value of MT where MT is AM cos omega MT. What is the maximum value of MT? AM. So this is K into AM that is your modulation index. Okay. So one important point to note down here is if, if K is not given in the question, tell me what, how do you calculate the modulation index? If K is not given in the question. If Ka is not given in the question, then how do you calculate the modulation index? If K is not given in the question, then how do you calculate the modulation index? Yes, AM upon AC. Okay. Yes, Tai uh, that is different thing. Uh, yes, AM upon AC. If K is not given in the question and uh, only message and carrier will be given, then you will calculate the modulation index by AM upon AC. Right. What is the bandwidth requirement of AM signal? So, when we substitute this message signal into the expression of AM signal, right so that is you will see this one okay so when you substitute this ac uh, 1 plus ka into message signal as single tone which is am cos omega mt and then cos of omega ct then we get this expression and this expression is used to calculate the bandwidth when we take the fourier transform so when we take the fourier transform we will get cos omega ct cos omega c plus omega m which is upper side band and the frequency which is less than the carrier frequency is known as lower side band so we will get lower side band carrier uh, and upper side band okay so these are the three band we will get so that is why it is known as double side band plus full carrier means double side band full carrier we call because there are two side bands and one carrier and the bandwidth is calculated by one side of the spectrum and the bandwidth is 2 fm so where fm is maximum frequency of the max message signal okay if there is a single tone then only one frequency will come which will be maximum and if it is multi-tone then we will calculate the maximum frequency of all the frequency present in the message and then twice it okay so after that we have the time domain representation again when we substitute the uh, single tone ex message signal in the expression of am then we get this expression and when we calculate the envelope this is ac1 plus ma cos omega mt and e max will be ac1 plus ma and e min will be ac1 minus ma so if we divide these two equation we get the uh, modulation index and if we at these two equation we get the carrier amplitude the carrier amplitude is e max plus e min by 2 and the modulation index is e max minus e min divided by e max plus e min okay and that is also given by in terms of the side of the trapezoid and the trapezoid side is uh, l1 and l2 where l1 is the uh, larger vertical side and l2 is the smaller vertical side so l1 minus l2 divided by l1 plus l2 will be your time domain representation of a m and modulation index right in the time domain representation of a m. so now if i take the modulation index less than one if i take the modulation index less than one then we get this type of signal if the message signal is sinusoidal then tell me what will we call the left hand side of the signal at t equal to zero we are getting this so what we you will call to the left hand side of the t equal to zero means for the t less than zero what is this signal for t less than zero what is this signal for t less than zero 
what is that signal what is the name for it ठीक क्या बोलते हैं उसको जब t लेस देन जीरो पे जो हमको सिग्नल मिल रहा है क्या होगा उसका नाम क्या बोलते हैं हम इसको That is known as unmodulated carrier. Okay, that is known as unmodulated carrier. Unmodulated carrier means simply AC cos omega CT. So simply the carrier signal is always called unmodulated carrier. Okay, and uh, after modulation, this yellow line is called the modulated carrier because you have modulated it through the message signal. So this is your modulated carrier, which is our S of T. okay that is our s of t and this white dotted lines and this white dotted lines are called envelope of the signal so that is called envelope of the signal and here in the trapezoidal shape you can see this is the short vertical side and the long vertical side l1 is the long vertical side and l2 is the short vertical side and from here we can calculate the modulation index as l1 minus l2 upon l1 plus l2 now when the modulation index is equal to 1 then the envelope lower envelope will start decreasing and the lower envelope will touch the zero and we will see this type of shape that is known as critical modulation when the modulation index is greater than 1 then the positive that negative envelope that negative envelope uh, sorry the envelope of the signal will go into the negative side not the negative envelope this ne negative side the envelope of the signal will go into the negative side and uh, when the signal will cross the zero when the envelope will cross the zero there will be a phase reversal effect so there will be a phase reversal that is 180 degree phase shift okay whenever this envelope will cross the zero or the am signal cross the zero there will be a 180 degree phase shift that is known as phase reversal so that is why we never want over modulated signal we don't want to see over modulated signal now what is the order of the bandwidth in case of uh, ssb sp we get the lowest bandwidth and uh, in case of vestigial sideband we have just bandwidth higher than the single sideband and for the double sideband and am signal double sideband suppressed carrier and the am signal we have the same bandwidth which is 2 fm so this is written over here the double sideband full carrier will have bandwidth 2 fm the double sideband suppressed carrier will also have bandwidth 2 fm ssb is having the bandwidth fm and vsb is having fm plus epsilon so when we increase uh, when we arrange in the form of order then the lowest bandwidth is ssb and then vsb and then double sideband suppressed carrier and the full carrier similarly order of power if i say then the power requirement will be minimum in case of single sideband because we are transmitting only one sideband and because in the vestigial sideband we are transmitting one sideband completely and some part of other sideband so the power requirement will be slight higher than the single sideband and in the double sideband suppressed carrier we are transmitting only two sidebands so that will be slightly higher than the vsb also and in the double sideband full carrier which is uh, am signal where we transmit two sideband along with the carrier we will have the maximum power so this will be the order of power okay that is the order of power in the increasing order now how do we calculate the power of any uh, am signal to what is the purpose of calculating the power because we are transmitting the amplitude modulated signal so if we are transmitting the amplitude modulated signal we want to transmit the two sideband along with the carrier because in the amplitude modulated signal we have two sidebands and the carrier so if we want to transmit am signal we have to transmit all the three signals that means we have to transmit the carrier we have to transmit the upper sideband 
we have to transmit the lower side band. So the power if I calculate that is nothing but the amplitude square divided by 2 into R. So the power of the carrier is amplitude square divided by 2 into R. So that is the carrier power and if I calculate the upper side band power that is also amplitude square that is AC MA by 2 whole square divided by 2R. So that is written as PC into MA square divided by 4. Okay, and similarly, this is also equal to the lower sideband power. So that is also equal to the power of lower sideband PC MA square by 4. So when we calculate this, this is your carrier power. This is your upper sideband power. This is your lower sideband power. If you add the upper sideband power and the lower sideband power, you will get the total sideband power, which is PCMA square by 2. And if you add all the powers, that means the carrier power and the total sideband power, that you will get PC1 plus MA square by 2. So this is your total power required. Or we also calculate the ratio of the sideband power to the carrier power the sideband power to the carrier power is ma square by 2 that is your modulation index square divided by 2 this is for sinusoidal signal okay this is for sinusoidal so in general we can say that the sideband power to the carrier power is directly proportional to square of modulation index this is in general Okay. Now, what is the power in terms of voltage and current? So, the total voltage is given by Vt is equal to Vc root over 1 plus ma square by 2 and It is equal to Ic root over 1 plus ma square by 2. So, total power Pt is equal to Pc 1 plus ma square by 2 and same in terms of voltage and current we can write. And uh, what is the transmission efficiency which is also known as power efficiency. So the ratio of the useful power to the total power is known as the transmission efficiency or the power efficiency. The useful power is nothing but a sideband power because our message signal lies in the sideband. So that is why we are more interested to transmit the sideband rather than the carrier. So the useful power is the sideband power and the total power. So when we calculate the ratio of the sideband power to the total power, we get MA square upon 2 plus MA square. This is nothing but the uh, transmission efficiency eta is monotonically increasing function of modulation index. So as you increase the modulation index, your modulation index uh, will increase, the efficiency will also increase. So you can see here that when the modulation index is 0.1, the efficiency is 0.5%. When the modulation index is 0.5, the efficiency is 11 percent and when the modulation index is 0 0.707 which is 1 upon root 2 the efficiency is 20 percent and when the modulation index is 1 when the modulation index is 1 the efficiency is 33.3 percent that means you are getting the maximum modulation index uh, 1 we can get because of the to avoid the over modulation so if we have the modulation index equal to 1 which is the case of critical modulation, the maximum efficiency that we can achieve is 33.3%. And now the power calculation in general, suppose uh, the past calculation we have done is for uh, only for the uh, sinusoidal signal. So if you want to perform this particular power calculation for general uh, signal, it can be for any random signal MT, then this is the AC cos omega CT which is your carrier signal and this is your AC KMT cos omega CT your sideband signal. So when you calculate the carrier power this will be amplitude square divided by 2 R and if R is not given then we take R is equal to 1 ohm if R is not given and similarly if I calculate the power of the sideband Power of the sideband is AC square K square SX divided by 2 where SX is the power of message signal and if I add the power of carrier and power of sideband then we get AC square by 2 plus AC square K square by 2 into SX this is not SX square this is SX 
and uh, the total power we have calculated okay so this will become ac square by 2 you can take common and this is 1 plus k square into sx okay and the transmission efficiency is nothing but useful power divided by total power so useful power is your sideband power and total power is your ac square by 2 this one so when you divide it you will get k square sx upon 1 plus k square sx right so just comment once whether it is clear up to this point or not up to the transmission efficiency in general quickly everyone okay good so it is clear up to this point okay now uh, let's go into the multi-tone case okay no power saving so chalo, uh, tell me aap log batao, what is the power saving Sabse pehle batao ki power saving ko define kaise karogi? then we will calculate it for the double sideband and the single sideband chaliye kyunki hum revision kar rahe na to itna to hum expect kar sakte hain ki aapko pata hoga हां छोटी-छोटी चीजें तो पता ही है हम तो रिवीजन कर रहे हैं कुछ नया कांसेप्ट हम सीख नहीं रहे हैं तो हम कुछ नया चीज नहीं बताएंगे ना रिवीजन हो रहा है हाउ डू यू डिफाइन द परसेंटेज पावर सेविंग Yes, so it is nothing but a power saved, how much power you have saved divided by total power. So for the double sideband, how much power you have saved? You have saved the carrier power. And what is the total power? This is PC 1 plus MA square divided by 2 into 100. So this will become 2 upon 2 plus MA square into 100 so this is the percentage power saving similarly for single sideband this percentage power saving is okay we are saving the power of carrier or power of either upper sideband or power of lower sideband okay this is the slash either you can take upper sideband or you can take the lower side when divided by total power into 100 so how much is the carrier power pc how much is the upper segment power which is pc ma square divided by 4 and how much is the total power it is pc 1 plus ma square by 2 into 100 so this is nothing but a 1 plus ma square divided by 4 whole divided by 1 plus ma square divided by 2 multiplied with 100. So, this is your percentage power saving for single segment, for single segment. Okay. Now, what is the power and the bandwidth calculation for the multi-tone? In case of multi-tone, this is your expression of AM signal. In case of multi-tone, you will have more than one frequency component. So, we are taking the two frequency component FM1 and FM2 and we are also assuming that the FM2 is greater than FM1. So, when we substitute this message signal into the above equation, we will get K into AM1 corresponding to the frequency FM1 and K into AM2 corresponding to the frequency FM2. So, because there are two different frequency and the corresponding to each frequency, we are getting the modulation index. So, here we are having more than one modulation index. So, according to that, when we plot it, we get the bandwidth which is the twice of maximum frequency component present in the 
message signal. So this is known as twice of highest frequency or the maximum frequency of message signal. Okay, so 2 into FM2, FM2 was highest frequency. Here we have tell, told that this FM2 is nothing but the highest frequency of the message signal MT. So the highest frequency is FM2. So this is 2 times of FM2. Okay, what is the power requirement? The power requirement will be PC 1 plus MA total square divided by 2 where MA total is root over MA1 square plus MA2 square. If there are only two frequency, then for each frequency we have one modulation index. So that is MA1 square plus MA2 square. And if there are more than one frequency component, then the MA total will be root over MA1 square plus MA2 square and so on up to MA n square. And the transmission efficiency is calculated as MA total square divided by 2 plus MA total square. MA total square upon 2 plus MA total square. Okay. So, this is the overall MA uh, modulation index calculation. So, now solve this question. Ninety-three point eight. Yes. So, because due to the amplitude modulation by a sine wave, if the total current in the antenna increases from four to four point eight, okay. So, it is increases from four to four point eight. That means the modulated current is four point eight, and the carrier current is four. And this is the formula: one plus m a square divided by two. Okay. So, when from here, when you will calculate, it will be zero point nine three eight or the in the percentage it is 93.8 percent okay so we have used the formula which formula i have used here the formula that i have used here is the total current which is after modulation and i see this is root over 1 plus m a square divided by 2 okay so this is the formula that we are using here the current always increases, the voltage always increases, the power also increases after modulation. So, this is after modulation. Okay, so this is after modulation. So, that is the modulated current. Okay, and this is the before modulation that is unmodulated current. Okay, now solve this question.
So what is the answer you are getting for this question? Okay, so now we are getting the double side bend. So this is the percentage power saving. So percentage power saving is 2 upon 2 plus ma square into 100. So here it is 2 upon 2 plus 0 0.8 whole square into 100. And after solving this, I am getting 75.76%. So that is your option C. Okay, now calculate the modulation index for this question. Calculate the modulation index for this question. Calculate the modulation index for this question. The modulation index is, in such case, the modulation index is given by, yes, E max minus E min divided by E max plus E min. So, and maximum envelope is 125 minus what? Uh, it is 25 divided by 125 plus 25. So, it is. Okay, so this is 2 by 3 or 66.6 percent. So that is right. What is the amplitude of carrier? So if I want to write the expression of the waveform, then what is the what is the amplitude of the carrier? If I want to write the if I want to write the expression, then what is the amplitude of carrier? Just now we have seen that amplitude of the carrier is E max plus E min divided by 2. So that is 125 plus 25 divided by 2. So it is nothing but is 75. So 75 is the amplitude. 0 0.67 is your carrier modulation index. This is your message signal and cos omega ct. So answer is option D. Now, next is solve this one. So, determine the amplitude and the phase of the additional carrier which must be added to make the waveform shown to attain a modulation index of 20%. If you have a 20% modulation index, and we have an additional carrier add. So, what should the carrier ka amplitude and phase kya hona chahiye? You are decreasing the value of modulation index. So, if you are decreasing the value of modulation index, then the carrier amplitude should increase.
what should be the additional carrier carrier amplitude should increase or decrease it should increase because we know that the modulation index is given by am upon ac so because the modulation index previously was 66.67% and now you are decreasing it to the 20% that means the amplitude should increase so amplitude should increase from 75 volt to what so it should increase from 75 volt because previously uh, when the carrier amp uh, carrier amplitude was 75 volt the modulation index was 66.67 now the modulation index is 20% then the carrier amplitude should be increasing okay so it should increase so what is the increased value it may be uh, 75 175 with 0 or 175 with phase shift 180 degree so how do we solve it so because we have s of t which was ac cos omega ct plus uh, this is your ac and uh, modulation index ma and then we have cos omega ct and cos omega mt and now we are adding another carrier ac dash cos omega ct why we are not changing the frequency because we are saying we are adding the carrier so the carrier will always have the frequency as omega c okay so here if i calculate ac omega ct common if i take then it will become 1 plus uh, AC dash upon AC and uh, here we have MA cos omega MT. Let me write in another way. Actually, okay, first of all, we have to write like this AC plus AC dash this is your cos omega ct plus ac ma cos omega mt into cos omega ct wait a second So now it is okay. So now if I take this AC plus AC dash cos omega CT common, then I will get 1 plus AC into MA divided by AC plus AC dash and cos omega MT. So obviously this is your modulation index. So this is your modulation index and this modulation index is now 20%. So this is 0 0.20 is equal to AC which was 75 and old modulation index was 0 0.667 or you can write 2 by 3 also. So this can be written as 2 by 3 also and this AC which is 75 plus AC dash. So this AC dash we want to calculate and when you calculate AC dash you will get 175 volt so we can write it as 175 at an angle 0 degree so the answer is option a okay the answer is option a got it Yes, so 175 is the right answer. Yes. Now, this is a similar question. We want to get the 80% of modulation index. So, what should be the value? The carrier amplitude should increase or decrease? Just let me know 
whether the carrier amplitude should increase or decrease if you want to attain the modulation index 80% in the same question. Yes, because the modulation index is increased, the carrier amplitude should decrease and what should be the value? So now, yes, so now only difference is that uh, in the second case of the question, now we have to keep this as 80% which is equal to 75 into 2 by 3 divided by 75 plus AC dash. So from here if you calculate, you will get minus 12.5 I think or you can write it as 12.5 at an angle 180 degree. So 12.5 at an angle 180 degree you will get. Okay, so 12.5 180 degree. That is your option B. Okay, now answer this question. Yes, because uh, uh, it is a sinusoidal carrier of 1 megahertz and is the amplitude moderated by the symmetrical square wave. So, symmetrical square wave will have only odd harmonics. Okay, this will only have odd harmonics. So, odd harmonics means this message signal will have the frequency F0 is equal to 1 upon time period. So, that is your 10 to the power 6 upon 100 which is nothing but a 10 kilohertz. So, odd harmonic means it will have F0, 3F0, 5F0 and so on. So, when we amplitude modulate it, okay, when we amplitude modulate it uh, in the AM signal, in AM signal, amplitude modulated signal, the frequency component which will present is FC plus minus F0, FC plus minus 3F0, FC plus minus 5F0, etc. So, from here we will get this is 1000 plus minus 10 and this is 1000 plus minus 30. So, this will give you 1010 and 990 and this will give you 1030 and 970 and these all will be present. So, 990, 1010, 1030 all will be present. The signal which will not be present is 1020. So, uh, 1020 will not be present because of the even symmetry, even signals, uh, that is even harmonics. And because this symmetrical square wave will have only the odd harmonics, so that is why we get the 1020 as not present in the amplitude modulated signal. Okay, so answer this question.
so an amplitude amplifier modulated amplifier has a radio frequency of 60 watt at 100% modulation the internal loss in the modulator is 4 6 uh, watt so actually when you perform the modulation okay this is am modulator so when you perform the modulation you will get the 66 watt of power and uh, out of which the internal loss that internal loss of you know internal loss of this modulator is 6 watt so you will get that 60 watt after that okay so the radio frequency output the radio frequency output with the 100% modulation is 66 watt so when you perform the am modulation you get the 66 watt of power but because of the circuitry loss you have get the uh, output of 60 watt so because we know the formula for the am signal so what is the formula for the am signal this is pt is equal to pc 1 plus ma square by 2 so the total power was generated was 66 but out of 66 the 6 watt is lost and then carrier power so that carrier power we want to calculate and modulation index is 100% so the carrier power will be 44 watt yes so the carrier power will be 44 watt yes 44 watt now coming to the next topic which is generation of double sided and full carrier so we have the two method which is switching modulator and the square law modulator and uh, square law modulator performs uh, that message signal and the carrier signals are added together and we pass it to the non linear device the characteristic of the non linear device will always be given to us and after the non linear device we have the appropriate bandpass filter and the response of the bandpass filter is also given to us and that will be uh, generating our am signal so these are the frequency component that we get when we pass it through the square law device having the characteristics v0 is equal to a1 vit plus a2 vi square t if you take this as a nonlinear device characteristic then you will get the output like this and uh, which will have the double side band full carrier over here so this will pass through the bandpass filter which is we have placed appropriately so the value that expression you get here is the carrier amplitude is increased by factor a1 a1 and a2 are the constant and the k is that is the amplitude sensitivity is 2 into a2 upon a1 and the condition for the carrier frequency is minimum carrier frequency should always be equal to 3 fm or greater than that okay now coming to the switching modulator in the switching modulator also message and carrier signals are added together so these are connected in series so these message signals and carrier are added together it will give you the vit which is the sum of message and carrier we will give message and carrier to the input of the diode diode will work according to the carrier cycle okay diode will work according to the carrier cycle so the carrier is sinusoidal which is positive for half time period and negative for another half time period so diode will be forward bias for half time period so that is the half time period of the carrier this is your carrier signal so this is the half time period which is t not by 2 for which it is high and for another half time period it is low so for another half time period it is low okay right then we get the signal spectrum like this and uh, the difference is here when uh, we calculate uh, the overall calculation we can do and we will pass it through the same bandpass filter because we want to generate the am signal we will have the bandpass filter centered at carrier frequency bandwidth should be 2 fm we will get this type of signal obviously these signals are not standard so that is uh, that can vary person to person or according to the waveform square waveform which we take but if the square waveform is what we have taken then we will get this expression and this expression 
we can apply this formula also and the condition for the carrier frequency is greater than or equal to 2 fm okay now solve this question So tell me what is the answer? Yes, so answer uh, we are getting is 2. So here you can see this is the carrier amplitude AC and here is the message signal. So the amplitude of the message signal here is 1. We are passing the addition of the carrier and message signal to the nonlinear device. This nonlinear device is passing through the standard equation. I mean having the characteristic uh, uh, transfer characteristics as the standard one that we have, we have discussed and we have passed it through the appropriate bandpass filter and we have generated the AM signal. So it is given that the sideband power is nothing but a half of the carrier power. So the, we know that the ratio of sideband power to the carrier power will become 1 by 2 and it is nothing but equal to the modulation index square divided by 2 because the message signal is sinusoidal. The message signal given here is sinusoidal. So that is why we can apply ma square by 2. So when we apply the ma square by 2, we get the modulation index as 1. And the modulation index is given by, for the sinusoidal signal, we can write it as k into am. And uh, am is 1. So modulation index is also equal to ka. And what is the value of ka? The value of ka is 2a2 upon a1. And a2 is the coefficient of square term and in here the coefficient of square term is b and a1 is the coefficient of linear term and here the coefficient of linear term is a modulation index is 1 so you will get a by b is equal to 2 so the answer will be option d which is 2 anyone having any doubt in this question Okay. Now solve this question. Now solve this question. What is the value of A1 and A2? What is the value of A1 and A2?
okay so here also you can see that uh, this is the x of t your uh, message signal and the carrier signal so the amplitude of the carrier signal here is 1 okay so the amplitude of carrier signal here is 1 so you can see this ac is equal to 1 and the nonlinear device is having the standard characteristics which we studied so here you can say that 2 into a2 upon a1 is the value of ka and the value of k is 0 0.5 so a1 is or a2 is equal to 0 0.5 into a1 upon 2 okay and the value of a1 the value of uh, carrier amplitude ac dash the new carrier amplitude is a1 times of old carrier amplitude okay new carrier amplitude is uh, a1 times of old carrier amplitude that is the output signal has the carrier amplitude 10 so that means in the am signal we have got the carrier amplitude 10 okay in the am signal we have got the carrier amplitude 10 so it is a1 into 10 and this is ac sorry a1 into 1 this is a1 into 1 and ac dash ac dash is 10 so a1 is equal to 10 a1 you are getting 10 so if a1 is 10 then it is 2.5 a2 is 2.5 so if i am asking for the product then it is 10 into 2.5 which is equal to 25 so 25 will be the answer is there any doubt in this question is there any doubt in this question Anyone else? Okay. Then we have the detection of AM. In the detection of AM, we have three methods square law, demodulator, synchronous detector, and envelope detector. In the square law demodulator, we will again use the same characteristics, but the difference is that instead of uh, message signal and the carrier signal, now we will give the input as the AM signal. So when you give the input as a am signal then you have nonlinear device uh, this signal you will pass so when you substitute the value of xt which is ac1 plus kmt cos omega ct you will get yt and this yt will have multiple frequency and uh, this yt will pass through the low pass filter so this yt will have number of terms okay this yt will have the number of terms and uh, this is the component you will get when you will pass it through the low pass filter you will get three components so you will get the uh, dc signal and your desired signal and your undesired signal right so this is the dc signal this is your desired signal and this is your undesired signal okay so we want to have the signal to noise ratio very very greater than one for this uh, when we take this dc signal neglected then we take the ratio of the desired signal to the undesired signal which is signal voltage and the noise voltage then we get the modulation index to be very very less than 2 so uh, square law demodulator is used where the modulation index is very very low now coming to the synchronous detector in the synchronous detector we have the balance modulator followed by the low pass filter the combination of the balance modulator and the low pass filter is called synchronous detector so again you will give input as a uh, am signal and it is called synchronous because the carrier frequency is locally generated or uh, is synchronized with the carrier frequency generated in the transmitter so this is ac1 plus kmt this is our am signal and we have given our carrier signal which is synchronized with the transmitter and when we give this to input we will get the output which is proportional to your message signal right now the envelope detector in the envelope detector we give input as the am signal it is a diode based circuit so again you will apply the am signal in at the input of the diode and this is the capacitor and the resistor over here and this capacitor and the resistor parallel combination will give you the charging and the discharging concept and from here it will follow the envelope here you can see uh, not this one yeah so this one 
here this uh, diode will be on whenever the diode will be on when the carrier is in the positive half cycle or when the carrier is greater than zero the diode will be on and when the carrier is less than zero the diode will be off so you can see that in during this duration the diode is off because the carrier is zero so the diode is off uh, carrier is negative so that is why diode is off and here also the diode is off so during this period the diode will be off diode will be off whenever the input is less than the output output is capacitor voltage the capacitor follows the envelope of the signal and to follow the envelope of the signal properly we have the time constant which is greater than 1 upon fc and less than 1 upon fm and there is another formula for the time constant uh, when the rc is less than 1 upon fc what will happen when the time constant is less than 1 upon fc what will happen because the time constant is very less it will discharge the capacitor very quickly through the resistor r and it will not be able to follow the envelope of am hence we want the time constant to be greater than 1 upon fc but what will happen if it will become greater than 1 upon fm which is the time period of message so if the time constant is very high that means it is taking too much time to discharge so when the uh, when the capacitor taking too much time to discharge it will again not follow the envelope and if in this case when it will not follow the peak value of this am signal then this is nothing but a called diagonal clipping so this is nothing but a called diagonal clipping yes very good tushar so uh, when the modulator index is uh, modulation index is greater than 1 then also the negative part of the envelope or the minimum part of the envelope goes negative and during the negative cycle the diode will be off hence it will again not follow the envelope and then you will get the distorted signal so when the modulation index is greater than 1 then also we will not be able to apply the envelope detector to detect the message signal so this is the capacitor voltage we get when the modulation index is less than 1 and time constant is proper and time constant is very very greater than 1 upon fc and less than 1 upon fm okay uh, janvi you can attend from now so whenever you give the input to the analog detector as a sinusoidal signal you will get the dc signal which is constant this constant is not here this constant is here and when you give the am signal as a uh, input to the analog detector with the modulation index less than equal to 1 you will get the output proportional to the message signal why we take the mod because the diode does not work in the negative half cycle so you will not get the output as negative you will always get the positive signal at the output of the analog detector when the modulation index is greater than 1 and you provide the am signal then you will get the output as a magnitude of envelope as a magnitude of envelope whatever will be the envelope you will get the magnitude of that envelope there is another formula that is your modulation index root over 1 minus ma square divided by ma into omega m when the time constant rc is less than equal to this okay this is another formula which will be derived from this fact that the slope of the capacitor voltage should always be greater than equal to the slope of envelope so don't forget that we have a mega workshop on 15th of january so you just tell to your juniors that uh, there is a seven mantra uh, for a beginner uh, from abhinav negi sir to ace the a 2024 this is a mega workshop this is free workshop you can attend here to attend this you can register yourself and the link is given in the description and there is a general aptitude session also uh, for uh, gate 23 uh, this is 15 marks uh, in the just 15 hours by the rakesh sir and also the rakesh sir and ankit sir will take the session on mathematics that is again a marathon session yeah now solve this question can you solve this question
and those who have not liked the session quickly like the session and let's make it 50 for now it is about 39 so if you have not liked the session just make it 50 quickly yes so the answer is b the answer is b because as i said that the time constant should be always in the range of 1 upon fc the time constant should always in the range of 1 upon fc to 1 upon fm so the fc is 1 megahertz so this is 10 to the power 6 and uh, it is 2 kilohertz so 2 into 10 to the power 3 so the time constant is greater than 1 microsecond it should be greater than 1 microsecond but less than 500 microsecond so in between the 1 and 500 in between the 1 and the 500 so not 1 not 500 and not less than 1 so obviously the answer is option b okay the answer is option b Now solve this question. So we know that for proper envelope detection, okay, for proper envelope detection, okay, for proper envelope detection, the modulation index should be less than or equal to 1. So what is the modulation index here? The modulation index is 2 upon AC, that is should be less than or equal to 1. So you can see that this is AC greater than or equal to 2. So the minimum value is 2. Okay, you can calculate the modulation index. See now we have the generation of the double sideband and suppressed carrier. So we have two methods, balance modulator and the ring modulator. In the balance modulator, we have the two amplitude modulator. And in the first amplitude modulator, we give the input as the message signal and the carrier signal as it is. So we get the uh, signal like uh, AC 1 plus KA into MT. The, both the AM modulator are symmetrical. So, K into MT cos omega CT. In the second balance modulator, we are giving the message signal after inverting it, that is phase reversal, but we are giving the same carrier signal. So, here we get the X2T, which is AC, but 1 minus KA MT because MT has become minus MT rest of the things are same so when you add this x1t and x2t you will get the double sideband suppressed carrier signal you can add them and you can see so this is the balance modulator you are here you are uh, output of the balance modulator the output of the balance modulator will be proportional to the product of message signal and the carrier signal so it is always the product of message and carrier. So whenever there is a multiplication of the two frequency uh, or the two signals, you can say that there will be a double sideband. One is uh, some frequency and another is the difference frequency. So low frequency signal, high frequency signal and when you multiply, you will get the uh, phase reversal in case of double sideband. In the ring modulator, this is the structure of the ring modulator or the circuit diagram for the ring modulator that is also known as lattice diagram, lattice modulator. Message signal is applied according to the primary windings of the transformer and the diode is uh, arranged in the form of a ring and uh, in the secondary winding uh, in the uh, output of this transformer, we give the input. Uh, we take the output and uh, give input to the bandpass filter. Bandpass filter will have the same uh, characteristics. The center frequency is Fc, the bandwidth is 2fm. 
so when we apply the carrier signal so when the carrier is in the positive half cycle when the carrier is in the positive half cycle the diode d1 and d2 will be forward bias and this message signal will uh, go through this path okay this, it will take this path and it will take this path so vit will become empty so vit will become empty because it will follow the same path which is forward path but but when the during the negative half cycle of the carrier the diode d1 and d2 will be off and d3 and d4 will be on so the message signal will follow this path so the signal which is positive the message signal is positive here now it will follow this path and this positive will be here and the message signal is negative over here so it will follow this path and it will reach to this point so this is negative so this is negative and this is positive so that is inverted so empty positive negative and this is inverted so vit is equal to minus of empty so here whatever message signal we are giving we are getting the inverted output so vit will be minus empty and when we combine these two equation so we will write the v naught t which is uh, vit which is input to the bandpass filter vit which is input to the bandpass filter is nothing but the product of pt and mt and this pt is the uh, square wave having the plus 1 and minus 1 for the half of time period then when we solve it we get this type of signal or when we time when we draw the signal in the time domain then we get this type of signal because this is positive this is positive when it will multiply with this message signal you will get positive so here you are getting positive where the forward bias that is the positive half cycle okay and during the uh, negative half cycle this is the negative half cycle even though the message signal is positive because the carrier is negative then the multiplication and positive and negative will become negative so this is the negative signal so again you are getting the positive here you are getting positive message signal is also positive so you are getting positive right so during the positive half cycle you your diode d1 and d2 will be on and during the negative half cycle of the carrier diode d3 and d4 will be on and in this way it will invert the signal okay so here also you will get the phase reversal so it shows that double sideband suppressed carrier also has the phase reversal during the zero crossing okay when the signal crosses the zero uh, in the message signal or that time we have the phase reversal yes uh, gajendra you can apply and apply kar do aap because atc generally log jaldi prefer nahi karte hain hai na aur wo bhi is point of time pe maybe aap agar luck acha hoga to aapko mil jayega i don't think ki uh, apply karne mein koi burai ho sakta hai enter view ka call na aaye hai na ye ho sakta hai ki aap shortlist na ho but uh, uh, you cannot take risk of because it is about your job है ना अब इसमें आपको कोई प्रिपरेशन तो करनी नहीं है जो स्कोर आपका ऑलरेडी आ चुका है उसी के बेसिस पे अगर आपको मिलना होगा तो मिल जाएगा तो अप्लाई तो जरूर कर दो है ना अगर मान लो मेरी प्रिपरेशन नहीं है और मैं किसी एग्जाम के लिए फॉर्म भरूं कि नहीं भरूं तो ये मेरा क्वेश्चन हो सकता है कि यार मेरी प्रिपरेशन नहीं है सपोज आई आर की मेरी प्रिपरेशन नहीं है तो आई का फॉर्म निकला है तो मुझे उसको फिल करना चाहिए कि नहीं करना चाहिए ऑब्वियसली नहीं करना चाहिए क्योंकि मेरी प्रिपरेशन ही नहीं है तो उसमें मेरे को डाउट हो सकता है लेकिन अगर आपके पास एक ठीक ठाक स्कोर है और आपको लगता है कि वैकेंसीज भी डिसेंट है और अगर इन लोग वन रेशियो फाइव में भी कॉल करते हैं तो तुम्हारा चांस है अगर मतलब आपका रैंक कितना है इस ट्रिपल फाइव स्कोर पे मुझे रैंक बताओ ट्रिपल फाइव स्कोर पे रैंक कितना है तो आई थिंक अगर ये हजार के अंदर है तो आपको अप्लाई करना चाहिए अगर ये हजार से आगे है मतलब तीन हजार के आसपास है तो फिर नहीं करना चाहिए अगर हजार डेढ़ तक है तो आपको करना चाहिए हाँ तीन हजार है तो फिर नहीं करना चाहिए थ्री टू एट नाइन इज नॉट ए गुड स्कोर फॉर द ए टी सी अप टू टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फाइव हंड्रेड तक भी आप एक बस हो सकते हो थर्टी टू हंड्रेड थोड़ा सा ज्यादा 
लिमिट मतलब रेंज क्रॉस कर गया है है ना वर्स्ट केस में भी 86 सिक्स डबल ई के लिए है तो वो भी मेरे ख्याल से जनरल का पोस्ट है कि आ, सब मिला के है तो ये भी इंपॉर्टेंट है अगर आप जनरल के हो और अगर पोस्ट जनरल में 86 है तब आप 2000 रैंक तक आप अप्लाई कर सकते हो अगर ओवरऑल है ना अगर ओवरऑल ही 86 पोस्ट है तो जनरल में फिर तो आपको हजार से भी अंदर रैंक रहने से ही कॉल आने की उम्मीद है टोटल है तो फिर बिल्कुल आप अप्लाई मत करो सो टू डिटेक्ट द सिग्नल है ना टू डिटेक्ट द सिग्नल डबल साइड बैंड सप्रेस के लिए सिम ऐसे सिग्नल को रिकवर करने के लिए हम लोग अगेन बैलेंस मॉडलेटर यूज करते हैं और बैलेंस मॉडलेटर में हमारा फंडा पता है कि बैलेंस मॉड सिंक्रोन डिटेक्टर में बैलेंस मॉडलेटर होता है फॉलोड बाय लो पास फिल्टर तो यहाँ पे हमारे पास एक्स ऑफ टी इज इक्वल टू मैसेज सिग्नल हो गया एम टी कॉस ओमेगा सी टी और इसमें हमने मल्टीप्लाई किसका कर दिया है आ, फिर से कॉस ओमेगा सी टी का मल्टीप्लीकेशन कर दिया है क्योंकि जो लोकल ऑर्टिलेटर से हम लोग कैरियर जनरेट कर रहे हैं वो भी कॉस ओमेगा सी टी है तो यहाँ से हमको मिल जाएगा एम टी डिवाइडेड बाय टू है ना और कॉस टू ओमेगा सी टी डिवाइडेड बाय टू तो ये हमारा कैरियर uh, सिग्नल को आउटपुट uh, ऑफ जो लो पास फिल्टर होगा वो इस कैरियर सिग्नल को रिजेक्ट कर देगा है ना सॉरी एम टी कॉस टू ओमेगा सिटी होगा यहां से आपके पास एम टी कॉस टू ओमेगा सिटी बाय टू होगा तो ये इसको रिजेक्ट कर देगा और आपका आउटपुट आ जाएगा एम टी बाय टू ठीक है तो वैसा सिग्नल आपका रिकवर हो जाएगा अब इसमें फेज एरर आता है आपका अगर थीटा फेज एरर आ गया मान लो है ना लोकल ऑसिलेटर अगर आपका प्रॉपरली सिंक्रोनाइज नहीं है और उसमें कैरियर के रिस्पेक्ट में जो कि ट्रांसमीटर में है उसके रिस्पेक्ट में अगर यहाँ थीटा का फेज एरर आ गया तो आउटपुट कितना आता है यहाँ पे एम टी इंटू कॉस ऑफ थीटा डिवाइडेड बाय टू है ना एम टी कॉस थीटा डिवाइडेड बाय टू आपका आउटपुट आ जाएगा ठीक अब एस एस बी में जनरेट करने के हमारे पास तीन मेथड है फिल्टर मेथड फेस शिफ्ट मेथड ओके सो एस एस बी एस सी वी कैन हैव द थ्री मेथड फिल्टर मेथड फेस शिफ्ट मेथड एंड रिवर्स मेथड सो इन द फिल्टर मेथड व्हाट वी डू इज वी हैव द बैलेंस मॉडलेटर देन द मैसेज एंड द कैरियर सिग्नल्स आर मल्टीप्लाइड एंड बैलेंस वॉट इज द पर्पज ऑफ बैलेंस मॉडलेटर द बैलेंस मॉडलेटर जनरेट द डबल साइडमेंट सप्रेस कैरियर सो वेन द मैसेज सिग्नल एंड द कैरियर सिग्नल आर अप्लाई टू द इनपुट ऑफ बैलेंस मॉडलेटर इट जनरेट द डबल साइडमेंट सप्रेस कैरियर एंड आफ्टर यूजिंग द एप्रोप्रिएट बैंड पास फिल्टर वन ऑफ द साइड बैंड कैन बी सप्रेस्ड एंड अदर साइड बैंड कैन बी जनरेटेड सो इफ देर आर टू साइड बैंड अपर साइड बैंड एंड लोअर साइड बैंड देन अपर साइड बैंड इफ आई सप्रेस देन वी गेट द lower side band as a single side band okay this is one method so this is you can see the double side band this is the upper side band okay this is the lower side band and because we are uh, using the band pass filter in such a way that it is passing only the upper side band it is suppressing the lower side band so this will become your single side band suppress carrier because there is no carrier right and in the phase shift method in the phase shift method we have the two balance modulator and in this two balance modulator uh, in the first balance modulator we give the message signal and the carrier signal appropriate uh, directly and in the second balance modulator this uh, message signal and the carrier signal both are taken as a hilbert transform and then we give input to the second balance modulator so we get the output as a ssb signal and uh, it is nothing but the empty cos omega ct and then plus minus this hilbert transform of the message signal and hilbert transform of cos is sin so this will be your expression of ssb sc so this is ssb sc okay and then we have the reverse method reverse method you can see this is the complex diagram so we are not doing the analysis you can see that uh, just the difference is here you can understand one important point over here in the second phase in the second phase here okay in the second phase here this part when there is a plus sign we get the upper side band and if there is a minus sign then we get the lower side band this is just the important point that you can note down here because in this 
complex circuit if you want to analyze if you suppose understood that the diagram which is given to us is a reverse method then uh, after whole calculation you will uh, calculate the single sideband now whether it is upper sideband or lower sideband that can be only uh, concluded after the whole analysis but the trick here is if the second carrier frequency is in the plus sign okay here at this point if this is fc plus w by 2 or fc plus any frequency according to the diagram and analysis the frequency may also be different but if it is fc plus something then it will give you upper frequency and if it is fc minus something then it will give you the lower frequency so according to that you can quickly calculate because uh, in this balance modulator in the first balance modulator uh, you will get the uh, w by 2 okay and uh, message signal frequency but we want to calculate the single side then now so from here only we can calculate uh, here from here you can calculate the message signal frequency okay and the carrier frequency you can calculate from this part okay carrier frequency you can calculate from this part and if it is plus sign then just conclude that you are getting fc plus sign. okay when you will do the whole analysis the output of each block if you calculate and at the end you will get the s of t as fc plus fm cos of fc plus fm or sine of fc plus fm whatever it would be a uh, mathematical expression i am not going uh, into that part just if i if somebody will ask me what will be the frequency at the output of this complete block then what i will do i will calculate the i will observe the message signal frequency from the input I will see the second carrier frequency from here and I will add them because there is a plus sign and if it is uh, cos of 2 pi fc minus w by 2 then I will conclude that here I will get the fc minus f. okay is it clear Now to recover the SSB signal, we use the same synchronous detector, the block diagram of the synchronous detector, you know, the balance modulator followed by the low pass filter and in the balance modulator, we give the input as a modulated signal and second input as a local oscillator frequency. Now, let's go into the next chapter, which is our angle modulation. Okay, let's go into the next chapter now angle modulation so we will quickly finish it around 12 30 or 12 45 then we will have break Yes, pre-envelope is slightly different than the complex envelope. Pre-envelope is the pre-envelope is nothing but some of the uh, you know pre-envelope if you want to calculate. Uh, okay, I will tell you later on because uh, it will be you know the time is actually we are running out of time. VSB is not required and we are not covering the complete syllabus okay in the eight uh, hours we cannot complete the complete syllabus i am only taking the important part so like uh, pre envelope is not important complex envelope is not important vsb is not important so i am leaving that part so in the angle modulation we have the frequency modulation and the phase modulation so let's go into the directly mathematical expression what is the general expression of uh, s of t 
that is the angle modulated signal which is ac cos omega ct plus phi so this is ac cos omega ct plus phi and if i want to calculate the instantaneous frequency so i have to take the theta so whatever angle modulated signal is given to us we have to differentiate with respect to time so when we differentiate with respect to time this is uh, omega ct plus phi so if i differentiate it i will get omega c plus d phi by dt and uh, if i want to calculate the instantaneous frequency then it is fi is equal to fc plus 1 upon 2 pi d phi by dt so that is important formula first important formula for the instantaneous frequency okay in the angle modulation now the second one is the frequency deviation so frequency deviation is the difference between the instantaneous frequency and the carrier frequency and it is given by 1 upon 2 pi d phi by dt so 1 upon 2 pi d phi by dt and if you want to calculate the maximum frequency deviation then first of all uh, 1 upon 2 pi you have to take the magnitude of d phi by dt okay you have to take the magnitude of d phi by dt and then calculate its maximum value so that will give you the maximum frequency deviation okay so whenever you want to calculate the maximum frequency deviation just remember one thing that first of all you have to take the magnitude and then you calculate its maximum value so uh, phase deviation what is the phase deviation phase deviation is uh, difference of phase between the modulated carrier and the unmodulated carrier so we have the modulated carrier what is the modulated carrier so here it is already written modulated carrier is our angle modulated signal and what is unmodulated carrier which is our carrier signal so what is the difference in phase of this the phase of the modulated carrier is phi and the phase of the carrier is zero so phi minus zero will be your phase deviation phi minus zero will be your phase deviation now coming to the phase modulation phase modulation says that phi is directly proportional to mt that means the phase of the carrier signal should vary according to the message signal so phase is phi so phi should vary according to the message signal proportionality constant we are using is kp so kp into mt now what is the unit of kp kp is phi upon mt which is radian per volt radian per volt now instantaneous frequency of the pm signal how do you calculate the instantaneous frequency fi is equal to fi is equal to fc plus 1 upon 2 pi d phi by dt from the definition of the instantaneous frequency fi is equal to fc plus 1 upon 2 pi d phi by dt and fi is equal to fc plus 1 upon 2 pi d phi by dt phi is equal to kpmt so we get the instantaneous frequency for the phase modulation fi is equal to fc plus kp upon 2 pi dmt by dt okay this is the formula now frequency deviation of the pm signal so from the definition of the frequency deviation delta f is equal to 1 upon 2 pi d phi by dt again when you put the phi is equal to kp mt you will get kp upon 2 pi dmt by dt and if you want to calculate maximum value as i told you kp upon 2 pi first take the magnitude of dmt by dt and then calculate its maximum value Now frequency deviation that is uh, sorry phase deviation it is not frequency deviation it is phase deviation okay this is nothing but a phase deviation so phase deviation of a pm signal this is delta phi is equal to kp mt so delta phi max is nothing but kp into maximum value of mt <laughs> now if you want to write the expression of the pm signal so in the general expression of the angle modulated signal ac cos omega ct plus phi okay and uh, then uh, phi is equal to kp mt so we will substitute ac cos omega ct plus kp into mt and if i take the mt is equal to am cos omega mt then the instantaneous frequency will become fi is equal to fc plus kp upon 2 pi dmt by dt and uh, the expression will be uh, this will be okay let me write here s of t is equal to ac cos of 
omega ct plus kp into am okay kp into am cos omega mt or it can be written as ac cos of omega ct plus beta into cos omega mt so this beta is the modulation index and that modulation index is defined as maximum frequency deviation divided by message signal frequency so it is the ratio of the maximum frequency deviation to that of the maximum modulating frequency now frequency modulation in case of frequency modulation the frequency deviation is directly proportional to the message signal so frequency deviation delta f is equal to kf into mt so from here this kf is nothing but a 1 upon 2 pi d5 by dt this uh, sorry uh, delta f is 1 upon 2 pi d5 by dt so if i want to calculate the value of phi then this d5 is equal to 2 pi kf when you multiply this 2 pi kf and then uh, message signal empty dt so what is the value of phi integration from minus t to minus infinity to t 2 pi kf f tau d tau so what is the expression of the fm signal expression of the fm signal is ac cos omega ct plus 2 pi kf integration from minus infinity to t m tau d tau where kf is in hertz per volt and if the kf is in radian per volt then there will not be 2 pi so sometimes it is also written a volt per second also they write in the unit so uh, hertz per volt second and radian per volt second is also there now uh, what is the difference between the expression of pm signal and fm signal in the pm signal message signal inside the cos was directly present and in case of fm signal the message signal present as a integration form so here the message signal is present in the form of integration okay so what is the expression of the fm signal uh, in the fm signal we have already calculated uh, sorry this is not the expression this is phase deviation okay let's leave it so we want to calculate the phase deviation what is phase deviation phase deviation is the maximum value of phase and phase is what 2 pi k of integration minus infinity to t m tau d tau so this is the value of maximum phase deviation okay so instantaneous frequency fi is equal to fc plus delta f fi is equal to fc plus delta f is equal to kf mt for fm so instantaneous frequency uh, that is the expression for single tone frequency deviation so delta f is equal to kf into am okay kf into am and modulation index is delta f upon fm so this is nothing but a kf into am upon fm so here you can see that the delta f depends on the amplitude of the message signal only and in case of the pm the delta f depends on the amplitude of message and frequency both the carrier swing what is the carrier swing the carrier swing is the difference between the maximum instantaneous frequency to the minimum instantaneous frequency okay always remember that the carrier swing is difference between the maximum instantaneous frequency to the minimum instantaneous frequency what is the carrier swing in this case in terms of kf so if i ask you because it is fm it is asking for the fm so we know that the frequency deviation is nothing but a fi minus fc so you can write fi is equal to fc plus delta f so what is the maximum value of instantaneous frequency this is fc plus 
kf into maximum value of message signal Mas maximum value of message signal is 2 so and what is the minimum value of the instantaneous frequency it is carrier frequency plus kf into minimum value of the message signal which is minus 5 so if i ask you about the carrier swing so the carrier swing is nothing but the difference of maximum instantaneous frequency to the minimum instantaneous frequency so that is nothing but the 7 kf okay so 7 kf will be the carrier swing is it clear Okay, so okay, so all this question. A sinusoidal message signal is given having a root mean square value of 4, frequency of 1 kilohertz is fed to the phase modulator with the phase deviation of 2 radian per volt. The carrier signal is this, the maximum instantaneous frequency of the phase modulated signal. So maximum instantaneous frequency, first of all let us write the instantaneous frequency for phase modulated signal is this okay so this is the root mean square value so this is the rms value and rms value we get by peak value divided by root 2 so the peak value of the message signal is 4 root 2 okay so the peak value of the message signal is nothing but a 4 root 2 right so, we know that if I want to calculate the maximum instantaneous frequency, then I have to calculate the maximum value of dmt by dt. The maximum value of dmt by dt. So, because the message signal is sinusoidal, the message signal is sinusoidal. What is the, if the message signal is sinusoidal, what is the maximum value? What is the peak value? So, the peak value will be V0 into when we differentiate, we will get omega m also. So, this is 2 pi. So, that is your carrier frequency which is 1 megahertz. Okay, and then we have the kp which is uh, your 2 and uh, 2 pi. V0 is 4 root 2 and fm message signal frequency is 1 kilohertz so 10 to the power 3 okay so this we will get so you can calculate its value you can calculate this value and you can put it here okay is it clear or not this expression is clear or not so maximum value i am taking as v0 and when we differentiate we get v0 into omega m as a peak value and we have divided it by 2 pi also
Okay, now try to attempt. Uh, okay, so answer this question. Answer this question. Solve this question. So what is the answer of this question? What is given here? That the phase deviation, the maximum phase deviation for FM is equal to maximum phase deviation of PM. So phase deviation is 2 pi integration minus infinity to T M tau D tau and multiplied with KF its maximum value and here uh, we have kp into mt and its maximum value okay yes correct okay so the kp and mt we want to calculate the ratio of what kp upon kf so this is the kp upon kf we want to calculate so this is 2 pi into maximum value of integration of mt dt and divided by maximum value of message signal so when we perform the integration we get when we perform the integration we get this type of signal Okay, this is the integration of message signal. Here, when we perform the integration, we will get this signal. Uh, from this side to this side, we will get REM because this is the unit step. 
so differentiation of unit step is ram and this is another unit step so we will get another ram and here also we will get like this negative ram okay negative ram then this and here also we get this okay so this will be the signal we will get and what is the peak value of this signal the peak value of the signal would be 4 the peak value of the signal would be 4 so this is 2 pi into maximum value is 4 what is the peak value of the message signal is 2 so this 2 and this 2 will get cancelled and the answer will be 4 pi okay this is 0 this is 4 Now, let us uh, discuss this type of FM. So, in the type of FM, we have the two types one is the narrow band FM and another is the wide band FM. When we call the narrow band FM, when the modulation index is less. So, when the modulation index is less, uh, this is the expression of the FM signal for a single tone. So, for a single tone, when we uh, expand it, okay, so we get AC cos A cos B. Okay, this is AC cos A cos B and uh, minus of sin A sin B. Okay, so when we expand it further because when, when we take the beta is very very less than 1. So, this cos will become, cos theta will become 1. So, this is AC cos omega CT and it will be AC into sin omega CT. And this sine beta sine omega mt will be approximated to beta sine omega mt. Okay. So, when we expand it, we will get this signal. We will get AC. Let me write here. When we expand it, we get AC. The cos omega ct will be here. And this is a formula of 2 sin a sin b which is minus of AC beta by 2 sin a minus b. So, this is omega c minus omega mt and plus AC beta by 2 sine of omega C plus omega MT. Okay, so this will be the signal. So here the lower segment is inverted. So here you can see this is the lower segment. This is the lower segment and this is the upper segment. So the amplitude of the lower segment is inverted. So the amplitude of lower segment is inverted. The bandwidth is equal to same as the AM signal which is 2FM. So, uh, this is the phasor diagram. Uh, this is your uh, carrier signal. This is the lower sideband which is inverted. This is the upper sideband. So, carrier signal is starting from the zero. This is the carrier signal having the amplitude AC. When the uh, you will draw the lower sideband, it is minus sign. So, it will be 180 degree phase shifted. So, original lower sideband should be here. But uh, because it is 180 degree phase shift, so this is minus AC beta by 2. When it was not uh, negative, uh, when it is not negative, then the lower segment should be this side, which is clockwise direction in the uh, from the AC clockwise direction of rotation will be omega mt. But because it is uh, negative, so it is 180 degree shifted. So it is 180 degree shifted and it is coming here. Similarly, you will have the upper segment which will be anti-clockwise direction of the angle omega m into t. So, when we take the addition phasor sum, then we will get the result of sideband which is the vertical line and this vertical line and the carrier is added together to get the resultant of the narrowband signal. Now, the similarity between the narrowband FM and the AM is the lower sideband is inverted in case of uh, narrowband FM and the amplitude modulation will have the positive lower sideband. So, everything is same, uh, the modulation index is different and the lower sideband is also different. Here the modulation index is defined by delta f upon fm and here the modulation index is defined by kp into uh, k into ma, am sorry. So, in the amplitude modulation this is k into am and in the narrowband fm this is 
theta is equal to delta x upon h. So in the wideband FM, the modulation index, the modulation index should be greater than one. Then we call it as a wideband FM. So uh, there is an expression. Expression we can derive as AC summation n equal to minus infinite to infinite j n beta and uh, cos of omega c plus n into omega m t. Okay, so this will be the expression of wideband FM signal. So when we draw it, okay, so when we draw it, we use the Bessel function also. What is the property of Bessel function? J n beta is equal to minus 1 to the power n j minus n beta. And for small values of beta, this is j naught beta uh, is equal to 1 and j1 beta is equal to beta by 2. For n greater than 2, it is 0. And j n square beta summing from minus infinite to infinite is 1. Then when we draw the uh, wideband FM signal, then we get this type of a spectrum and it shows that the bandwidth is infinite. Okay, because the upper side band goes up to the positive infinity, lower side band go in the negative side and the overall bandwidth is the infinite. So that is the ideal bandwidth. But uh, because uh, we don't want ideal infinite bandwidth, we always want to transmit the uh, finite uh, bandwidth signal. So how can we find, uh, send this finite duration signal, finite bandwidth signal? So Carlson says that uh, instead of transmitting all the 100% of the energy or power, you just transmit the 99 or 95 percent of energy then you can have the finite bandwidth and that bandwidth is given by okay that bandwidth is given by 2 into delta f up plus fm or 2 into beta plus 1 into fm so this is the carlson rule to calculate the bandwidth of fm signal we always use the carlson rule if it is wideband fm signal uh, so power calculation can be done uh, the power calculation simple it is very simple that uh, what is the total power requirement uh, in case of fm signal so this is nothing but a ac square by 2r okay this is the total power requirement or in case of wideband fm signal what is the carrier power requirement so uh, the expression let's write from the expression the expression of the wideband fm signal is ac summation n is equal to minus infinite to infinite j n beta and cos of omega c plus n omega m t. So when I put n equal to 0, I will get a c j 0 beta and cos of omega c t. So this is our carrier signal. So what is the power of the carrier signal? This is a c square j naught square beta divided by 2r. So this will be our carrier signal, right? Now, what is the transmission efficiency? So, the transmission efficiency eta is nothing but the uh, sideband power to the carrier power because, but in the case of wideband, we have the infinite sidebands. So, we cannot calculate that power. So, what we can do directly is we can calculate the total power and out of the total power, if I subtract the carrier power, I will automatically get the sideband power. So, if I write this, then it is PT upon PC minus 1. Okay, so this is the transmission efficiency or the power efficiency. So the total power is AC square by 2R and uh, wait, wait. Yeah, so this is PT actually. So this eta is equal to 1 minus PC upon PT. So, this eta is equal to 1 minus j naught square beta. Okay, because PC is PC is AC square uh, j naught square beta upon 2R. So, we can write what? PT into j naught square beta. Okay, so we want to calculate PC upon PT. So, this PC upon PT is j naught square beta. So, what it shows that you can achieve the 100% efficiency we can have the 100% efficiency if you make this J0 beta 0. So how can you make the J0 beta 0? J0 beta can be 0 for the different value of beta. So the beta is 2.4, beta is 5.5, 8.8, 11.76. 5, 11 for all these values of beta, this is J0 beta plot. So the plot of J0 beta is 0 for 2.4, 5.5, 8.8 .8, and 11.76. And in, at this point of time, you will get the 100% efficiency.
okay so you know about the get and esc test series also so we have the test series full length mock test test series the link is given in the description you can go visit okay okay so now we are having a break of one and half hour so now we have the break of one and half hour okay so we will start at 2 pm okay we will start again at 2 pm okay so in the at 2 pm we will have a random variable session so random variable and the random process okay so we will go up to 2 pm to 4 pm okay we will go up to 2 pm to 4 pm and then we will start again from 4 30 yes whole communication so 4 30 pm we will again start and we will take the digital communication or maybe uh, it may be 4 to 4 30 actually or 2 to 4 30 let's take 2 to 4 30 and from 5 pm onward so from 5 pm onward we have the digital communication okay this will be the last session 5 onwards so we will not take break after that so after 5 pm we will not take break okay and yes one more thing that we can revise over here is just the uh, super auto and receiver so do you know about uh, the super auto and receiver i don't think uh, means i have given the ppt but it is not in included over here so uh, let's take uh, what is the image frequency what is the image frequency the image frequency is radio frequency minus uh, sorry plus 2 into intermediate frequency what is the condition of using this as a image frequency what is the condition of using this as a image frequency can you tell me when you can apply this formula if local oscillator frequency is greater than rf frequency okay that is that is local oscillator frequency is radio frequency plus intermediate frequency okay when we have the image frequency as frf minus 2 into fif if the local oscillator frequency is less than radio frequency so that is local oscillator frequency is equal to rf frequency minus if frequency okay so these two will be the formula and uh, another formula is for the image rejection ratio what is the image rejection ratio this is 1 plus q square into rho square where this rho is equal to image frequency divided by radio frequency minus radio frequency divided by image frequency okay right is it okay this three formula also And what is another formula for the in, uh, image rejection ratio in terms of gain? 
in terms of gain can you tell me what is the formula in terms of gain what is the formula for image rejection ratio in terms of gain Okay, so gain, yes, F i upon F t. Yes, so gain at so gain at radio frequency and at image frequency. Okay, gain at radio frequency and gain at image frequency. Got it. Gain at radio frequency divided by gain at image frequency. So this is the about the superheterodyne receiver formula, and uh, let's start the session. As I have told you, that there is a break of one and a half hour.
Hello. Hello, everyone. So we are back with the new concept that is the random variables. I think the voice is clear, absolutely fine. So share the session with all of your friends. Quickly share the session so that we can resume the session again. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, dreamer. Yes, good afternoon, Sonali. So let's start the session. Uh, that is the concept of random variable. So random variable is a function or rule by which we assign the real number. Okay. So uh, this is random variable is a function or rule by which we assign the real number to each value of sample space of a random experiment. Okay, so basically in the random variable what we do we will have some function and by our rule we will have either rule or the function by which we assign the real number to each sample point of the random of the sample space in the random experiment okay so it is a mapping from the sample space to the real axis and the random variable is always denoted by the capital letters so here when we perform a simultaneously experiment like we are tossing a coin simultaneously then we can have head 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 tail tail head and tail tail so these sample points will have the probability 1 by 4 each and when we map them to the real axis by the rule, the rule is we will assign the real number according to the number of tail appear in the sample point. So if we see the sample point, there is a number of tail is 0 in the first sample point, then number of tail is 1 and then 1 and then 2. Then what is the random variable value? Random variable value will be 0, 1 and 2. So we will assign the real number 0, 1 and 2. So lambda 1 is the sample point. So we will assign the 0 and lambda 2 and lambda 3 we will assign the sample value 1 and then for lambda 4 we will assign the sample value 2. So this is how we perform the mapping. Next uh, the probability of each sample point is 1 by 4. So probability of x equal to 0, probability of x equal to 1 uh, is uh, the summation of the probability of uh, head tail and tail head that is 1 by 4 plus 1 by 4 which is 1 by 2 and the probability of x equal to 2 is also 1 by 4. So uh, remember that we do not uh, assign the real number okay we do not uh, assign the uh, two different real number to one single sample point. So here you can see that here I have drawn this diagram particularly. So here you can see that in this uh, mapping one real number can be assigned to two different sample point like in the previous example we saw uh, there were two different sample point but we assigned the single real number that is one but a sample point is two different uh, two different real numbers cannot be assigned to one sample point like in this case you can see that the lambda 2 uh, in this mapping we have the lambda 2 which is mapped to the two different real number 1 and 2 so it is not possible 
okay one and two it is not possible two different real number you cannot assign to a single random variable or a sample point so next is a uh, cdf how do you define a cdf so cdf is f of x given uh, f of x is equal to probability that random variable x takes value less than equal to x so cdf of a random variable x is defined as the probability that random variable x takes value less than equal to a small x where this is small x is a real number which will have the range from minus infinite to infinite and uh, capital x is the random variable and the f capital f denotes the cdf so what are uh, how do we define the cdf so suppose the same experiment we have performed we have performed the two uh, we are tossing the two coins simultaneously and suppose by some rule or by some function we got this real number 1 2 3 4 so this 1 2 3 4 are the real number assigned to head 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 tail tail head and tail tail respectively and the probability of each uh, real uh, real number is 1 by 4 so probability of x equal to 1 is 1 by 4 probability of x equal to 2 x equal to 3 x equal to 4 all are 1 by 4 so if we want to define the pdf or oh sorry cdf then it will be uh, probability that x less than equal to uh, capital uh, capital x less than equal to small x so when we draw it uh, we will get the staircase form so the probability density uh, cumulative distribution function uh, will be a cumulative distribution function will be a staircase form and why we are getting the staircase form because this is the example of discrete random variable because uh, there is a finite number of real numbers and all the random variables has the distinct value of real number so this random variable values are distinct 1 2 3 4 all are distinct so that is why we will have the uh, discrete random variable and for a discrete random variable the cdf can be written as summation i equal to 1 to n probability of xi u of x minus xi so uh, cdf can be defined in terms of unit step function when the random variable is a discrete random variable so there are three type of random variable basically first is continuous random variable second is a discrete random variable and third one is your mixed random variable okay so third one is your mixed random variable so how do you define the continuous random variable when the cdf of a random variable has the continuous form okay that is continuous everywhere so you can read this a random variable is said to be continuous if the density function sorry distribution function if the cdf is continuous everywhere it is continuous everywhere uh, and smooth that it can be represented by integral of some non negative function it is integral of some non negative function what is the discrete random variable a random variable is said to be discrete type when it has a continuous staircase distribution function that is the cdf will be continuous staircase except for finite number of jumps that means you should have finite number of jumps so in this diagram we have c jumps that means there is a finite number of jump discontinuity and the continuous staircase form cdf and mixed random variable will combine the properties of both uh, continuous random variable and the discrete random variable so what is the property of continuous random variable the cdf is continuous everywhere and what is the property of uh, discrete random variable there should be at least uh, jump uh, or the jump discontinuity should be finite so here you can see that between minus x1 to x2 we have the continuous cdf and at x2 we have the jump discontinuity so here it has the jump so that is why it is a combination of continuous and the discrete so that is known as mixed random variables next we coming to the property of the cdf so what is the property of the cdf uh, f of x is between 0 to 1 the pdf the cdf is always between 0 to 1 and uh, the value of cdf at minus infinity is 0 the value of cdf at infinity is plus 
CDF is always a non decreasing function. So it should be always continuously increasing, increasing, increasing and increasing. So it is a never decreasing function. So when the x2 is greater than x1, then the CDF at x2 is greater than equal to CDF at x1. CDF at x2 is greater than equal to CDF at x1. Now the property of the CDF is CDF is always continuous from the right. It is always continuous from the right. Uh, when we call it as a continuous everywhere, when fx of a minus and fx of a and fx of a plus, if all are same, then we call it as a continuous everywhere. And if it is x equal to a, it has a discontinuity. And fx of a is equal to fx of a plus, then it will be called as the continuous from right. Because fx of a is not equal to fx of a minus, so it is not continuous from the left. It is only continuous from the right because fx of a plus is having the value fx of a. So that is known as continuous from right. Now, if you want to calculate probability at x equal to a, so probability at x equal to a is fx of a minus fx of a minus. So if the CDF is continuous everywhere, then the probability of x equal to a is 0. And if the CDF is having the discontinuity at x equal to a, then the probability of x equal to a is probability of x less than equal to a minus probability of x less than equal to a minus. Okay. If CDF is having the discontinuity, then you can calculate this particular probability at x equal to a. But if the CDF is continuous at the point of uh, where you want to calculate the probability, then it will be 0. What is the next property of the CDF? Probability that x greater than a and less than equal to b. Probability that x greater than a and less than equal to b is fx of b minus fx of a. If the CDF is continuous everywhere at x equal to a and x equal to b, at x equal to a and x equal to b, we want to calculate. And if it is continuous, then either you put equal sign every, anywhere, it will be same. Suppose fx of x greater than a and less than b, that is also same. And suppose if I put uh, fx of uh, x equal to a also, I have uh, keep then probability of x equal to a I have to add but probability of x equal to a is 0. So probability of x equal to a is 0 because it is continuous. So it will become fx of b and fx of a. So this is the second equation. This is the first equation and this is the third equation. So if even if you remove any probability then also because it is continuous. So when it is continuous what does it mean? Uh, continuous means probability of x equal to a and a probability at x equal to b both will be 0. So that is why all the value will be same. Okay. And if it is having the discontinuity at x equal to a and x equal to b or both, then how will you write this? So to write this, let me give you here. See, we have the standard equation like this. Probability that a is less than x and less than equal to b. This is our standard equation. So according to this, we have the property that fx of b minus fx of a. Now, okay, now uh, at x equal to a, x equal to b, it is discontinuity. that is jump. It is having discontinuity. Then if I want to calculate probability that a less than equal to, I am adding the equal sign, x less than equal to b. So with respect to the previous property, which is fx of b minus fx of a, one thing I have done extra is probability of x equal to a I have added and because the at x equal to a at x equal to a we are having the discontinuity we cannot equate it to 0 
we have to write fx of b minus fx of a plus fx of a minus minus fx of a so this fx of uh, what i am missing so we have to add this probability of x equal to a and uh, probability of x equal to a minus we are getting a okay wait wait i have written something fx of a and fx of a minus this is i have written opposite okay so this fx of a and this fx of a will get cancelled and we will get fx of b minus fx of a minus so this we will get okay so what i have done here is i have added the probability of x equal to a similarly you can remove we can remove like this okay suppose if you want to calculate this probability then this will be fx of b minus fx of a with respect to this formula but we have neglected we have neglected the probability of x equal to b so that means fx of b minus fx of a minus of here you can write fx of b minus fx of b minus so here we will get fx of b minus minus of fx of a okay so this we will get so from this property from this property if at x equal to a and x equal to b uh, the cdf is having the discontinuity then you can write this and this okay and if suppose at x equal to a and x equal to b it is not discontinuous then the probability of x equal to a will be zero the probability of x equal to b will be zero and the result will always be fx of b minus fx of a like in the case of 6 property number 6 case 1 property number 6 case 1 so is it clear is it clear to everybody let me know okay now next is pdf uh, the pdf is nothing but the okay so now the pdf pdf is a continuous distribution function of a continuous random variable is nothing but the differentiation of the cdf so pdf is defined as the differentiation of cdf so what is the property of this pdf and if i 
take the same example that I am tossing the coin simultaneously, then we get head, 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 tail, 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 and tail, head. Then we get the same values x, 1, 2, 3, 4. We have got the staircase form uh, in the CDF. This is the CDF. So in the CDF, we have got the staircase form. Now, if I differentiate it, okay, if I differentiate it, then I will get, suppose I differentiate it, I will get the impulse function because the differentiation of unit step is impulse. So we will get the impulse function. Okay, so fx of x is equal to fx of x is 1 by 4 and we have got the impulse at 1, 2, 3, 4, right. Now, the probability density function have also few properties. First property that because the CDF is a non-decreasing function, the derivative of the CDF will always be positive. That means the PDF is always a positive number, okay. It is a always positive and uh, fx when you integrate the PDF or you can say the total area under the PDF is always equal to 1. So if you calculate the area, it will be always equal to 1. If you want to calculate the probability in some range, then you have to integrate the PDF in the given range that is from x1 to x2. If you want to calculate the CDF from the PDF, then you have to integrate the PDF from minus infinite to x. And if you want to calculate at x equal to infinity, suppose why we are taking the upper limit as x because we want to calculate the function as a function of where the variable is x. So the CDF as a function, so upper limit cannot be finite because otherwise it will become finite integration. So the limit is minus infinity to x. So whatever you will uh, write in the upper limit that will be inside the CDF. So like here we have written infinity or uh, so we have written the inside the argument of the CDF there is a infinity or vice versa. So fx of infinity is minus infinite to infinite fx of x into dx is equal to 1. So that was we have already discussed that the CDF at infinity is 1. So now the characteristic of the random variable the first uh, is the expectation or the mean value. So for a continuous random variable x bar is equal to expected value of x is equal to minus infinite to infinite x into fx of x dx and for a discrete random variable x bar is expected value of x summation i equal to 1 to n x i and probability of x i that is the value of random variable multiplied with the probability of random variable. So moment about origin, moment about origin is expected value of x to the power n is equal to minus infinite to infinite x to the power n fx of x dx where n is the order of moment. For a discrete random variable, expected value of x to the power n is equal to summation i equal to 1 to n x i to the power n n probability. So if I calculate the first order moment that is if I put n equal to 1 in the uh, moment equation, so m1 equal to expected value of x to the power 1 that is equal to minus infinite to infinite x into fx of x dx. So x into fx of dx is nothing but a mean. And if I take n equal to 2, then this will become second order moment and which is m2 is equal to expected value of x square. Whatever is inside the expectation that will come here. So x square fx of x dx and that is nothing but the mean square value of random variable. So second order moment about origin will be the mean square value of the random variable which is also equal to the total average power. Now characteristic of the random variable, so moment about mean uh, that is the for a continuous random variable mu equal to expected value of x minus x bar to the power n. x minus x bar to the power n is equal to summation minus infinite to infinite x minus x bar to the power n fx x dx where n is the order of moment. Again, for discrete also we can write. Suppose I put x equal to 1, then it will become first order moment. So first order moment will be here you can see if I put n equal to 1, so expected value of x minus x bar to the power 1. So summation minus infinite to infinite x minus x bar to the power 1 fx of x dx. So if you will write it like this, minus infinite to infinite x into fx of x dx minus infinite to infinite x bar into fx of x dx 
then this will be mean value and the mean value here also so this will give you the result zero so why the first order moment about the mean is zero because of this reason now coming to the next n equal to 2 second order moment is known as variance so here also you can write like expected value of okay so expected value of x that is a small okay then no variable no? so this is x minus x bar whole square so when we expand it x square plus 2x into x bar plus okay that is minus sign minus 2 into x into x bar x bar whole square so this is expected value of x square minus 2 into x bar is common so that is expected value of x plus x bar whole square is common so expected value of 1 so this is nothing but the expected value of x square minus uh, this is x bar whole square so this is known as variance so variance of random variable x okay variance of random variable x is given by this relation so variance of random variable x is given by sigma x square is equal to expected value of x square minus x, x bar square this is known as variance this is known as mean square value and this is nothing but a mean whole square so a mean square value represents the total power so it sigma x square represents the ac power this is equal to total power minus mean whole square Okay, this is the relation. Mean whole square means which power? DC power. Yes, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, share the session also. So what is the property of mean if I calculate the mean value of a constant if I calculate the mean value of constant we get the constant itself if we calculate the mean value of ax plus b we get ax bar plus b when we calculate the mean value of uh, cx then we get c into x bar and when we calculate the mean value of x plus y that means the sum of two random variables then it is x bar plus y bar next what is the property of the variance of a constant variance of a constant is zero and variance of constant into x is c square into variance of x so when we combine these two property we get the variance of ax plus b which is a square plus variance of x and variance of b is zero and variance of x plus y if x and y are independent if x and y are independent then variance of x plus y is variance of x plus variance of y and if it is not independent then we cannot write it okay so if the random variable the sum of the random variable we want to calculate the variance of sum of random variables then if the two random variables are independent then their uh, variance is also added now tell me what will be the variance of x minus y okay if i want to calculate the variance of x minus y if x and y are independent then what will be the variance variance of x minus y
yes so it will be sigma x square plus sigma y square right because x and y are independent okay so yes it is not negative okay satyashri it will not be negative because they are independent and we have to derive it actually then you will come to know why they are not changing even if there is a minus sign between the two random variables if the random variables are independent then you will get the same answer x plus variance of y variance of x plus variance of y okay so this can be proved here suppose x and y are independent okay if x and y are independent and we want to calculate the variance of x plus y so we want to calculate the mean value of x plus y so mean value of x plus y is x bar plus y bar right and when we calculate the mean square value of x plus y then it is nothing but a mean square value of x plus y means expected value of x plus y whole square so you will write expected value of x square plus y square plus x 2xy okay so this is expected value of x square plus expected value of y square plus 2 into expected value of xy and because the two random variables are independent this is expected value of x square plus expected value of y square plus 2 into x bar into y bar because this is independent now so when there are two random variables a and b are independent then we can write it as expected value of a multiplied with expected value of b so likewise we have written now we know that the variance is equal to variance is given by mean square value minus mean whole square so what is the mean square value mean square value is expected value of x square plus expected value of y square plus 2 into x bar into y bar minus mean whole square that means x plus y bar whole square so when you will solve it you will see that you will get expected value of x square minus x bar square plus expected value of y square minus y bar square okay and the first term the first term is nothing but a variance of x and the second term is nothing but a means last two terms are variance of y okay okay satyashri is it clear so next is uniformly distributed random variable so a random variable is said to be uniformly distributed if its probability density function is constant throughout the given range so for the given range it is constant pdf you can see that for a to b the pdf is flat so the pdf is constant for the given range then we call it as a uniformly distributed random variable so what is the mean value of this uniform distributed random variable can you tell me what is the mean value mean value of mean value is given by okay mean value that is x bar is nothing but a a plus b by 2 that is the mean value of uniformly distributed random variable a plus b by 2 and what is the mean square value the mean square value is given by b square plus ab plus a square divided by 3 so that is your mean square value okay and the next one is 
वेरियंस तो वेरियंस इज गिवन बाय बी माइनस ए होल स्क्वायर डिवाइडेड बाय ट्वेल्व तो दिस इज योर मेन स्क्वायर वैल्यू सॉरी वेरियंस ओके यस दिस इज द वेरियंस Now what about the Gaussian random variable? A random variable is said to be Gaussian. A random variable is said to be Gaussian. A random variable is said to be Gaussian if its probability density function is given by one upon root over two pi sigma x square and e to the power x minus x bar whole square divided by two sigma x square for all value of x for all value of so do you know about this function okay is it clear that the cdf you can calculate from integrating the pdf so the cdf uh, the pdf is a bell shaped curve the function which we have calculated this is fx of x which is 1 upon root over 2 pi sigma x square e to the power minus of x minus x bar whole square divided by 2 sigma x square for all x then when we plot it we get the bell shape curve and this bell shape curve is symmetrical about its mean so mean is x bar so it is symmetrical about its mean and at mean it is having the maximum value exactly at mean mean we have the maximum value and then it start decreasing uh non linearly in either side in either side it will start decreasing okay so this is the general representation of the gaussian random variable any gaussian random variable is represented by mean and variance because to write the probability density function we need only two things mean and the variance so it is written as grv and in bracket the first value represents the mean and the second value represents the variance so if i am writing the x which is a gaussian random variable x which is a gaussian random variable 0 comma 1 that means mean is uh, pdf is symmetrical about origin and the variance is 1 okay the pdf is symmetrical about origin that is mean is 0 okay this first value tells you the value of mean which is 0 and the second value tells us the variance which is 1 now what is the cdf of a gaussian random variable the cdf of a gaussian random variable is fx of x it is equal to 1 minus q of x minus x bar divided by 2 sigma x not two na no? x minus x bar upon sigma x. Two will come or not? Two will come or not? Here in the denominator, two will come or not? Tell me. Two will come or not? Quickly. here in the q function there will be two or not the two will come or not i am asking that in the denominator where it will be two or not
okay no right yes so two will not come next next topic of the random variable is the transformation of the random variable so when we transform a single random variable to a another random variable you can perform the multiplication you can perform the addition you can have the algebraic like 2x plus y uh, 2x plus 5 this is how you are generating another random variable y so y is equal to 2x plus 5 so you are transforming the random variable x into y so there are multiple way to transform this and so it depends on the transformer transfer characteristics of the transformation so the transformation can be the transformation of continuous random variable so transformation of continuous okay uh, so transformation of continuous random variable means uh, it can be monotonic and it can be non monotonic so transformation of discrete random variable also monotonic and non monotonic so in the monotonic transformation whether it is increasing or decreasing so if the value of x1 corresponding to the value of x1 we have the value of y1 so when we have the characteristic in such a way that for each value of x1 we have the different value of y1 then it is called one to one mapping or monotonic transformation you can see that for x1 we have y1 for x2 we have y2 there is no value which is repeating so in the monotonically decreasing also uh, for x1 we have y2 for x2 we have y1 okay so we have the two different uh, values and uh, for each value of x we are getting only the single value of y so that is known as monotonic transformation and if the characteristic of the block is given in such a way that it is a monotonic transformation then fy of y is equal to fx of x divided by magnitude of dy by dx so due to calculate the pdf of the output we calculate it as fx of x divided by dy by dx now the non monotonic transformation for the non monotonic transformation for x1 and x2 and x3 for the three different value of x we have the single value of y which is y not so in such case the pdf of output can be calculated as summation over n fx of xn dy by dx at x equal to xn and then take my magnitude first of all calculate dy by dx then put the different values of x because of which you are getting the same value of y that is x1 x2 and x3 you will substitute uh, and when you substitute x1 x2 x3 uh, after differentiating you may get the negative value also so take the magnitude and then take that particular value and divide it by the cd uh, pdf divided by the pdf so in the discrete transformation what happens in the discrete random variable again there is a two ways one to one mapping that is monotonically increasing or decreasing and another is non monotonic so if it is monotonic suppose you map x1 into y1 y x2 into y2 x3 into y3 and xn into yn so if you are mapping the x1 x2 xn and so on up to yn then for each value of x there is a one value of y so whatever will be the probability of x1 the probability of y1 will also be equal to probability of x1 okay so probability of y1 is equal to probability of x1 because there is a monotonic transformation so whenever this x1 will occur this y1 will be achieved whenever the x2 will occur the y2 will be achieved and the probability of x1 x2 and y xn will be given to us because that is the uh, generated part that is the generator part so we know the probability so the probability of yj is equal to yi is equal to xi that means okay that means uh, once you get the probability you can write the cdf and pdf so once you get the probability you can write the because it is a discrete random variable so you can write summation over i equal to 1 to m you can write probability density function that is probability of yi and delta y minus yi so that is nothing but the pdf and in the case of many to one if suppose there are two random variables if there are two values of random variable which are mapping into the single value like here you can see that 
in the diagram probability of y1 will be equal to probability of x1 because for each value of x1 there is a y1 but probability of y2 the y2 is generated because of probability of x2 and probability of x3 because here for x2 and x3 both we are getting the y2 only then we will add the probability of x1 x2 and x3 to get the probability of y2 and similarly when we calculate the probability of yn according to diagram we can see that this xn is mapped into yn then the probability of xn will be equal to probability of yn and once you calculate the probability you can calculate its pdf by summation i equal to 1 to m and probability of yi and delta y minus yi Okay, so can you can you solve this question? Can you solve this question, guys? Solve this question. All this question. We have to calculate the PDF of Y. So so when we put X equal to minus 1, we get Y equal to 2. When we put X equal to 1, then also we get 2. And when we put uh, x equal to 3, we get 18. So basically, it is 2 and 18. So what is the probability of y equal to 2? 
the probability of y equal to 2 is probability that x equal to minus 1 plus probability that x equal to 1. So, this is 3 by 4. So, y equal to 18 Okay, one, 3 by 4 is the probability and the value is y equal to 2 and 1 by 4 is the probability and value is 18. So, this will be our PDF for the random variable y. Is it clear? Is it clear to everyone? Now solve this question. What is the answer for this question? Now let us calculate the CDF because this CDF is fx of x is given by minus infinite to x and the PDF fx of lambda d lambda I suppose. So it is the x greater than 0 so minus infinity to x it will be a into e to the power minus b mod x dx okay or you can write b lambda d lambda b lambda and d lambda. So, this is nothing but a minus infinite to x. Uh, this can be broken into minus infinity to 0 uh, a into e to the power minus b lambda because it is negative. So, in this uh, minus lambda will be negative. So, e to the power b lambda d lambda plus uh, 0 to x it is a into e to the power minus b lambda d lambda. So, this is a upon b e to the power b lambda limit from minus infinite to 0 plus uh, it is uh, a upon minus b e to the power minus b lambda limit from 0 to x. So, when you put a 0 it will be 1 that is a by b and when you put um, e to the power minus b x and when you put a 0 you will get again a by b with this plus.
तो आंसर इज ऑप्शन बी ओके व्हेन यू विल ऐड देम व्हेन यू विल ऐड देम ए बाय बी व्हेन वी टेक कॉमन सो वन प्लस वन इज टू सो इन ब्रैकेट टू माइनस ई टू दावर माइनस बी एक्स दैट इज ऑप्शन बी Okay, now can you tell me the answer of this question? What is the answer of this question? See, here we have the CDF, and uh, we know that we want to calculate the PDF. So the integral differentiation of the CDF is that PDF. So when you differentiate, this is the ramp function. So when you differentiate, you will get a step function, and the slope of the ramp will become height of the step. So this is the height of the step, which is 0.5, and uh, this is the unit step. So when you differentiate the unit step signal, you will get impulse. so impulse will have the height which is equal to 0.5 because the value of k is 1 here so this is 0.5 delta x minus 1 so again answer is option b yes What is the answer of this question? Uh, Arush, no other chapters uh, like antenna will all only come, and that antenna will be taken by the uh, Rakesh sir. ठीक है राकेश सर आपके एंटीना सब्जेक्ट लेंगे और ट्रांसमिशन लाइन और हम लोगों ने एक पोलिंग क्रिएट किया था सो वी हैव क्रिएटेड वन पोल एंड इन द पोल वी हैव गिवन द फोर चैप्टर्स वेव प्रोपोगेशन ट्रांसमिशन लाइन वेव गाइड एंड एंटीना सो वी गॉट द टू पोल्स टू हाईएस्ट पोल्स ऑन द चैप्टर ट्रांसमिशन लाइन एंड द एंटीना सो ट्रांसमिशन लाइन आई हैव कवर्ड यस्टरडे एंड नाउ द एंटीना विल बी कवर्ड बाय राकेश सर Uh, there may be my previous video in the different uh, you know uh, place so you can look for that uh, just go for go in the and in the youtube and search like emft uh, revision okay uh, sakit sir then maybe you will get the video and you can revise it from there yeah option b option b is the right answer because the student and teacher both are wrong uh when we are calculating the mean value here so the mean value is nothing but the uh summation over i equal to 1 to n then the value of random variable and probability of random variable so random variable is having the value 
and probability is 0. Okay, then so it is three point five now, but it is given as uh, okay, it is coming as three, but uh, the given as three point five. So when we calculate the mean square value. So 1.5. Uh, last query for ET. What part uh, we need to do in the EMFT basics? Uh, so actually uh, we have revised it in the uh, our channel only. Uh, I and Rakesh sir have revised. So you can check that video. Uh, we have covered in the four hours. So that particular topic you can uh, revise, and that is sufficient for the EC student also. Although that video is for electrical, but you can uh, go and revise that. Okay, now solve this question. Solve this question. So here in this question, we have to take the three different cases. Case number one. Okay. So before taking the cases, let me explain what is given to us. Uh, it is given that. Okay. It is given that the CDF of random variable u, which is probability that random variable u takes value less than equal to x. Okay. This is given as f of x. And CDF of B, 
v less than equal to x is defined and both are identical these two are identical but if i write f of 2v then we will write probability that random variable 2v less than equal to x so we will write probability that v less than equal to x by 2 and this is defined as g of x so this is equation number 1 and this is equation number 2 uh, we have f of x and g of x now we have to uh, give the relationship between this f of x and g of x so we are considering the case number 1 when the x is a positive when x is positive let us suppose x equal to plus 2 then f u of x will become probability that random variable u take less than equal to 2 and f of 2 v takes uh, probability that v less than equal to 1 so we know that the cdf is non decreasing okay we know that cdf is non decreasing okay cdf is non decreasing then if the random variable has the large value if the random variable is having the large value like random variable is having the large value which is 2 then its corresponding cdf is f u of x which is defined as f of x and if the random variable has the value 1 random variable has the value 1 which is this one so in corresponding to this we have g of x so when we take the difference between f of x and g of x so f of x minus g of x is equal to 0 okay this is positive not 0 So case number 2 when x is negative f u of x is probability that a random variable u takes value less than equal to minus 3 and a probability that random uh, this is 2v less than equal to minus 3 so this is probability that v less than equal to minus 1.5 and this is g of x this is x negative because we are talking about the x negative so this is x equal to minus 3 and corresponding to minus 3 we have f of x okay this is f of x and corresponding to minus 1.5 we have g of x okay so if i take the difference between f of x minus g of x it will be less than 0 Now tell me if these two cases are clear then can you conclude the answer if these two cases are clear then can you conclude the answer which one will be the answer The answer is D, na? The answer is D, Ravi Teja. 
is it clear why we are talking uh, answers is d c yes when we take the difference when we take the difference you can see that this is f of x minus g of x multiplying with x we are saying that this is greater than 0 because when x is positive this is also positive when x is positive this is also positive so the positive positive will become positive positive will become positive that means greater than 0 if x is negative then the difference is also negative and negative negative will become positive so it will be again greater than 0 so and if the x is 0 then obviously this multiplication will be 0 so this equal sign is also valid so option d is the right answer okay Ravi Next, solve this question. Yes, so this is the random variable z which is we can say 3v minus 2u and if I talk about the mean value of z because when we uh, do some algebraic operation in the Gaussian random variable then we get the Gaussian random variable itself that means it is expected value of v minus 2 into expected value of u so the mean value of u and v both are 0 so the mean value of z is 0 and if the mean value of z is 0 because the z is Gaussian in nature so the density function the PDF of Gaussian random variable is always symmetrical about its mean so it is symmetrical about its mean here so z is equal to 0 it is symmetrical about its mean so now we want to calculate the uh, from here if we write probability that z greater than 0 that means half of the area half of the area area under the pdf which is 1 by 2 so the answer is 1 by 2 any doubt what is the variance of z variance of z tell me what is the variance of z What is the variance of Z?
ठीक है वेरियंस ऑफ वी इज वन बाय नाइन एंड वेरियंस ऑफ यू इज वन बाय फोर एंड बिकॉज दे आर इंडिपेंडेंट इट इज गिवन दैट दे आर इंडिपेंडेंट सो आई टोल्ड यू दैट वेन दे आर इंडिपेंडेंट वी हैव टू एड दैम सिंपली वी हैव टू एड दैम So probability that z greater than two, given that probability z greater than one, that is okay. So we have to calculate the probability z greater than two intersection with z greater than one. That is nothing but. One minus probability that z less than two. So it will be equal to one minus. One minus e to the power minus one. E to the power minus two divided by e to the power minus one. So e to the power minus one will be done. Yes, Gajin. Okay. Now answer this question. ओके okay, तो so एक बार मैं मैं आपको हाइट कर देता हूँ क्वेश्चन देख लो जीरो मीन गोशन एंडम वेरिएबल एक्स पासिंग थ्रू ए सिस्टम ट्रांसफर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक इज शोन बिलो You have to tell the PDF of random variable for this function. Come on. तो आंसर आ रहा है आपका सी ओके बट द राइट आंसर इज ऑप्शन ए
ओके द राइट आंसर इज ऑप्शन ए बिकॉज आप यहां पे अगर देखें तो इफ एक्स इज ग्रेटर देन इक्वल टू जीरो देन द वाई इज वन इन इफ एक्स इज लेस देन इक्वल टू जीरो वाई इज माइनस वन सो वी हैव द टू रैंडम टू वैल्यूज ऑफ वाई विच इज वन एंड माइनस वन सो वॉट इज द प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ वाई इक्वल टू वन द प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ वाई इक्वल टू वन इज वेन एक्स इज ग्रेटर देन जीरो ओके प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ वाई इक्वल टू वन इज प्रोबेबिलिटी दैट एक्स इज ग्रेटर देन इक्वल टू जीरो सो हाउ डू यू कैलकुलेट दिस जीरो टू इन्फिनिटी एंड द पी डी एफ ऑफ एक्स डी एक्स सो वॉट इज द पी डी एफ ऑफ एक्स बिकॉज दिस इज द जीरो मीन गोशन रैंडम वेरिएबल सो दिस इज जीरो मीन गोशन रैंडम वेरिएबल मीन्स इट विल बी सिमेट्रिकल अबाउट इट्स ओरिजिन सो वॉट इज द प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ एक्स ग्रेटर देन जीरो वन बाय टू ओके तो द प्रोबेबिलिटी इज वन बाय टू प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ वाई इक्वल टू वन इज प्रोबेबिलिटी दैट एक्स ग्रेटर देन इक्वल टू जीरो विच इज वन बाय टू सो द प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ वाई इक्वल टू वन इज वन बाय टू सो प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ वाई इक्वल टू माइनस वन इज ऑल्सो वन बाय टू बिकॉज देर आर ओनली टू आउटकम्स एट वाई so y equal to 1 by 2 and y equal to minus 1 is also have the probability 1 by 2 so option a will be the right answer okay because you can see that how do we write the pdf pdf is uh, probability delta y minus 1 plus probability delta y plus 1 okay ओके so in the joint random variable we have the sample space and this sample space is mapped into the two coordinate system i mean so you can say the two dimension when we map into the two two dimension then we get the joint random variable so joint random variable means it is involved with the two random variables f x y x comma y probability that x less than equal to x and y less than equal to y which is the cdf of the joint random variable and for the discrete random variable this is f x y x comma y summation i equal to 1 to m and j equal to 1 to n uh, probability of x i y j u of x minus i and u uh, u of y minus y j कोई ड्रेस कोड नहीं होता है देर इज नो ड्रेस कोड ओके सो नाउ द प्रॉपर्टी ऑफ द ज्वाइंट सी डी एफ इट इज फर्स्ट द डेंसिटी फंक्शन सॉरी द सी डी एफ इज ऑलवेज बिटवीन जीरो टू वन एंड एट माइनस इन्फिनिटी माइनस इन्फिनिटी और एट माइनस इन्फिनिटी कॉमा वाई एंड एट एक्स इक्वल टू माइनस इन्फिनिटी एक्स कॉमा माइनस इन्फिनिटी द वैल्यू विल बी जीरो एंड वेन बोथ द एक्स एंड वाई विल बी इन्फिनिटी देन इट इज इक्वल टू वन एंड वेन एक्स कॉमा इन्फिनिटी एंड दिस विल बी गिविंग यू एफ एक्स ऑफ एक्स विच इज द मार्जिनल सी डी एफ एंड इफ एफ एक्स वाई इन्फिनिटी कॉमा वाई देन इट इज एफ वाई ऑफ वाई विच इज अगेन द मार्जिनल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन फंक्शन विथ रिस्पेक्ट टू वाई okay next is property when as the you know cdf is a non decreasing function 
So the fifth property is also says that the CDF is a non-decreasing function. And uh, if you want to calculate the probability in the given range from x1 to x2, y, y1 to y2, so this is fx y x2 comma y2 minus fx y x1 comma y2 minus fx y x2 comma y1 plus fx y x1 comma y1. This is the property. And then uh, if you want to calculate the joint PDF, so obviously it you have to differentiate the CDF joint PDF with respect to x and y. And similarly, you can write for the discrete random variable also you have to write the joint probability then delta x minus xi and y minus yj what are the property of the joint pdf again the total area under pdf is equal to 1 cdf is a non decreasing function so pdf will always be positive and uh, if you want to calculate the cdf from the pdf then you have to integrate it from minus infinity to x to minus infinity to y and uh, the joint pdf and suppose you want to calculate the marginal dense marginal distribution okay that is marginal cdf if you want to calculate the marginal cdf then you integrate it from minus infinity to x if you want to calculate uh, the marginal cdf of x then you have to integrate up to minus infinity to x and the other limit should be minus infinity to infinity and similarly if you want to calculate the C marginal cdf of y then you have to integrate from minus infinity to y and the other integration limit will be minus infinity to infinity you will get the marginal cdf if you want to calculate the probability in the given range then you have to integrate the joint pdf in the given range and then if you want to suppose calculate the marginal density this is the marginal density this is the marginal pdf so if you want to calculate the marginal pdf with respect to x then integrate the joint pdf with respect to y and if you want to calculate the marginal pdf with respect to y then integrate the joint pdf with respect to x okay mean value of x and y so suppose you want to calculate the mean value of function g of x comma y then put the g of x comma y and use the joint pdf you will get the expectation if you want to calculate the moment suppose expected value of x to the power n y to the power k summation minus infinite to infinite summation minus infinite to infinite x to the power n and y to the power k and then the joint pdf n plus k is the order of the moment so can you tell me case one when we put n equal to 0 and k equal to 1 what we will get when you put x equal to 0 but n equal to 0 so x x to the power 0 and y to the power 1 this is nothing but the expected value of y which is nothing but the integration from minus infinite to infinite minus infinite to infinite y into x comma y dx dy so this is nothing but the mean value of y okay this is nothing but the mean value of y now if you put expected value of x to the power 1 and y to the power 0 then it will give you the expected value of x so you will say that we are getting mean value of x so we will get mean value of x okay so suppose you calculate uh, expected value of x square and uh, y to the power 0 then it is known as expected value of x square which is mean square value of x it is mean square value of x suppose you calculate if x to the power 0 y to the power 2 then we get expected value of y square so we will calculate mean square value of y mean square value of y similarly if we calculate the n equal to 1 and k equal to 1 so we get expected value of xy this is known as rxy it is called correlation between x and y okay this is correlation between x and y which can be calculated as minus infinite to infinite minus infinite to infinite f x y f x comma y dx and dy now moment about mean so if i put n equal to 0 k equal to 2 then expected value of x minus x bar to the power 0 and y minus y bar to the power 2 
so this will become expected value of y minus y bar to the power 2 can you tell me what it will give it will give the variance of y it will give you the variance of y similarly if you put uh, n equal to 2 then it will be x minus x bar to the power 2 and it will give you the mean square value not mean square value variance it will give you mean is variance of x it will give you the variance of x okay now if i put n equal to 1 and k equal to 1 then we will get expected value of x minus x bar and uh, y minus y bar can anybody tell what it is going to give us expected value of xy minus expected value of x y bar minus expected value of x bar into y and minus minus become plus expected value of x bar y bar so it is nothing but the r x y minus expected value of uh, when we calculate this is x bar y bar this is also x bar y bar and this is also x bar y bar so this two will get cancelled and we will get r x y minus x bar y bar this is known as p x y which is nothing but a covariance it is nothing but a covariance so covariance between x and y covariance between x and y right so important point to note down here is important point to note down here is if x and y are independent if x and y are independent random variables then x and y will always be uncorrelated okay so we say that this r x y is equal to x bar y bar then we call it as uncorrelated okay this is very important point to note down that rxy is equal to x bar y bar then they are uncorrelated basically we should write like this that whenever the cxy Okay, this is another one point and the, uh, another point you can no, add here is, another point you can add here is, uh, if cxy is 0, then x and y are uncorrelated. Okay, and another point you can note is, rxy equal to 0 what will happen if rxy is equal to 0 what will be when rxy is 0 what will happen if rxy is 0 then x and y are said to be orthogonal okay orthogonal when the correlation is zero then x and y are said to be orthogonal what is the random process when the random variable become function of time so a random process is a time varying function that assigns okay that assigns a random variable is a time varying function here you can see a random variable is a time varying function here so this random variable a random variable is a time varying function that assigns the uh, outcome of a 
a random experiment to each time instant random process can be continuous and discrete so when we have the real value time function we call it as a random process so suppose we assign a random sample point as a real value uh, time function so here you can see suppose sample space is s this is the sample space s okay suppose this is the sample space s okay this is the sample space s and uh, when we assign the real value time function to each sample point so the sample point is lambda 1 and the lambda 2 so when we assign the real value time function when we assign the real value time function to each sample point then it creates the random process if we sample the random process we get the random variable so sampling of random process is random variable now what is the first order stationary so if the pdf of x1 t means if the pdf is first order stationary means if the first order pdf is uh, not changing with respect to time then we call it as a first order stationary what is the second order uh, p stationary function when the second order pdf is not uh, uh, changing with respect to time that is it is independent as a function of time then it is called the second order stationary second order stationary can also be proved as a wide sense stationary if the autocorrelation of that particular second order stationary process is function of time delay and the second is if the mean is constant so if the mean is constant suppose the mean is constant okay suppose the mean is constant and the autocorrelation will be function of time if the autocorrelation is function of time delay okay then it is called the white sense stationary so what is your uh, cross correlation so a two random process xt and yt are said to be jointly white sense stationary if the cross correlation which is defined by rx y t1 comma t2 is a function of time delay so expected value of x of t1 and expected value of y of t2 that is also your cross correlation and uh, mean ergodic mean ergodic means uh, if suppose you calculate the mean value of a random process and if you calculate the time average value of the random process if both are same then it is known as mean ergodic okay so suppose this is the first point that we are saying that uh, uh, the for time average value of the random process so simply how the way you calculate the time average 1 upon 2t integration from minus t to t and x of t dt limit t tends to infinity is same like a power how do you calculate the power just it is like same but you have to uh, you integrate uh, a mod square but here we have to integrate the process itself so this is time average and when you calculate the mean value it is minus infinity to infinity the random process itself the random process itself and the pdf so if these two are equal then it will be called as mean ergodic and similarly for autocorrelation you can calculate and uh, if you calculate the time average value of autocorrelation and simply the autocorrelation if these two are equal then you will say that this is the uh, ergodic in the autocorrelation okay similarly the two random process x of t and y t are said to be jointly ergodic jointly ergodic also you can calculate if r x y that is the cross correlation is equal to time average value of the cross correlation so not every white sense stationary process is a ergodic but every ergodicity to maintain uh, of a random process converging to their respective statistical averages so what is autocorrelation autocorrelation is rx of uh, t1 comma t2 expected value of x of t1 and expected value of x of t1 multiplied with x of t2 and if it is a white sense stationary then the result will be function of time delay the important property of autocorrelation autocorrelation is always greater than uh, is always maximum at zero and it is always greater than rx of tau magnitude of rx of tau okay so rx of zero is always greater than equal to magnitude of rx of tau the rx tau is equal to rx of minus tau that means it follows the even symmetry total average power can you can calculate when the autocorrelation at tau equal to 0 if you calculate autocorrelation at tau equal to 0 
okay auto correlation at tau equal to 0 gives you the total average power which is mean square value auto correlation cannot have the arbitrary shape and uh, if random process x of t is periodic component then the auto correlation will also have the periodic component with the same time period and the last property if the random process is ergodic then you and having no periodic component if x of t is a ergodic and having no periodic component then limit mod tau tends to infinity rx of tau will give you the dc power which is mean whole square which is mean whole square How do you calculate the cross correlation? So, cross correlation is simply expected value of x of t1 and y of t2. Property of cross correlation rx y equal to 0 if the x and y are orthogonal, as I told you, that rx y equal to 0 means it is for the joint random variable also they are uncorrelated, uh, they are orthogonal. And if we are talking about the process, then the process is also orthogonal. And if x and y are independent, then rx y expected uh, will be expected value of x of t multiplied with y of t plus tau. Because they are independent, that means uh, you can write expected value of a b is equal to expected value of a multiplied with expected value of b. Okay. Suppose it is independent, then you write like this now expected value of a multiplied with expected value of b. So, similarly here, uh, if we are calculating Rx y tau, then this is expected value of x of t1 or simply x of t for a wide sense stationary. This is x of t, then y of t plus tau. So, because they are independent, so we can write this expected value of x of t multiplied with expected value of y t plus tau. Okay. So, in this way we write. Now let us calculate the covariance. So covariance is uh, for a wide size stationary process, the auto covariance is Cxx is equal to Rx tau minus x bar whole square. For a wide size stationary cross covariance is Cxy is equal to Rxy tau minus x bar y bar. If Cxy is 0, if Cxy is 0, then x and y are said to be uncorrelated as I have already defined. Now let us come into the power respected density. So, power respected density is mostly calculated by its property that uh, we will discuss that. So, what is the power respected density property? Power respected density is always greater than equal to 0. The total area under the power respected density gives power and the third one is the it always follows the even symmetry and the power respected density are always real. So, how do you calculate the power respected density? So, we have the formula to calculate the autocorrelation. Okay, we have the formula to calculate the autocorrelation. Suppose we calculate the autocorrelation by expected value of x of t and x of t plus tau. So, once you calculate the autocorrelation, you can calculate the power spectral density by taking the Fourier transform. So, this is about the fifth property that the autocorrelation and the power spectral density are Fourier transform pair. So, this is known as winner kinchen relationship. The sixth property is the total power is nothing but the in any circuit, the total power is sum of AC power plus DC power. So, uh, minus infinity to infinity Sx of F dF, it is the total power which is area. So, we can divide this minus infinity to 0 minus Sx of F, 0 minus to 0 plus Sx of F and 0 plus to infinity Sx of F. So, these two are A AC power, these two are called AC power and this one is called the DC power. From 0 minus to 0 plus, if you integrate the power spectral density, then this will give you the DC power. Suppose you give the input to any system as a random process. If the X of T is a random process which is giving input to the LTI system, then what will be the output? Output will be, output random process will be, uh, first of all, this is mean value of output is equal to h of 0 into mean value of x and this h of 0 is transfer function at f equal to 0. Transfer function at f equal to 0 not t equal to 0. Second, if you want to calculate rx y tau, rx y tau that means cross correlation that is rx tau convolved with h of minus tau. rx tau convolved with h of minus tau 
so this is known as cross power expected density if you take the fourier transform you will get the cross power expected density which is sx of f and h complex conjugate of f because this is h of minus tau so time reversal property when you apply it it is h h complex conjugate of f so similarly ry of tau is h of tau and h of minus tau and uh, rx tau convolution so when we take the fourier transform h of tau will have the fourier transform h of f h of minus tau will have the complex conjugate of h of f so when you multiply these two it will become h of f mod square so the power expected density of output is equal to h of f mod square into sx of f and if you multiply the random process with the cos and the sign signal then what will be the power expected density of the yt so the power expected density of yt whether it is a cos or sine it will be 1 upon 4 the power expected density of input shifted at frequency of the cosine by which you are multiplying and amplitude is divided by 4 amplitude is divided by 4 amplitude is divided by 4 and So is it clear up to this point? Is it clear up to this point? Let me know. So the cross power expected density, the cross power expected density is uh, sxyf is equal to sx minus f or sx complex conjugate of f so it is not equal it is not sxyf is equal to sy of f it is not like even symmetry okay it is sx minus f but the real part follows the even means real part is even and the imaginary parts are odd uh, and uh, if x and y are orthogonal then sxy and syx both are zero because the correlation is zero uh, and uh, when they are uncorrelated then sxy is equal to syx f is equal to x bar into y bar into delta f so when x and y are uncorrelated then the power expected density the cross power expected density is equal to x bar mean value of x mean value of y and delta f yes that is the conjugate symmetry so gajan you are from double e na so how you are attending Okay, now solve this question.
okay so mean value we can calculate limit tau tends to infinity rx of tau which is equal to limit tau tends to infinity 25 plus 4 upon 1 plus 6 tau square so it is 25 so this is nothing but a mean whole square so mean whole square so the value of mean we wanted to calculate it is 5 now we want to calculate the mean square value mean square value is autocorrelation at tau equal to 0 which is 29 and we want to calculate the variance so variance is mean square value minus mean whole square so mean square value is 29 minus mean whole square is 25 so it is 4 so answer is uh, mean is 5 and the variance is 4 For KVS, what is KVS? KVS. Okay, so now Okay, okay So second order moment means second order moment means expected value of y square let us suppose y is this one This I am taking as y Okay, so now this is expected value of x square 5 plus x square 2 minus 2 into x of 5 and x of 2. So this is the rx of 0 plus rx of 0 minus 2 times of rx of 3. So rx of 0 is a, this is also a minus 2 times of rx of 3 that is a into e to power minus 3 alpha. So here we have 2a common and 1 minus e to the power minus 3 alpha. So 2a 1 minus e to the power minus 3 alpha that is option D. Next is this question. Can you solve this?
So this is the random process. We want to calculate at t is equal to 1. So x of 1 when we write, this will be 2 cos 2 pi plus y. So 2 cos 2 pi plus y is cos y only. So when we put y equal to 0, we get x of 1 equal to 2 cos 0 that is 2. Okay. When we put y equal to pi by 2, we get x of 1 is equal to 0. So we are getting the value of random variable x as 0 and 2. So what is the probability of x of 1 equal to 0? The probability of x equal to 1, x of 1 equal to 0 is probability of y equal to pi by 2 and probability of y equal to pi by 2 is 1 by 2. Similarly, the probability of x of 1 equal to 2 is probability of y equal to 0 that is 1 by 2. Okay, so what is the mean value? Mean value of x of t, expected value of x of t is random variable value and its probability and the random variable value and its probability. So this is equal to 1. Now solve this question. Okay, so let's solve this question. In this question, it is given that sigma d, that is the variance of d of n, which is x of n minus x of n minus 1, is 1 tenth of the sigma x square. So let's first calculate the mean value of x and variance of x. So mean value of, where is that? mean value of x. So, mean value of x n, the mean value of x n is expected value of x n minus 1, both will be 0. It is given. Okay. So, what about the variance? So, variance of x is nothing but the mean square value of x minus mean whole square. So, if the mean is 0, then the variance is equal to mean square value. So, variance is equal to mean square value. Okay, so variance is equal to mean square value. Now, it is asking for d of n. So, d of n is equal to x of n minus of x of n minus 1. Okay. So, x of n and x of n minus 1. So, if I want to calculate the mean value of d of n, then this is expected value of x of n minus of x of n minus 1. So, this is expected value of x of n minus expected value of x of n minus 1. So, the mean value is 0, mean value of x is 0, so the mean value of d is also 0. And if I want to calculate the variance of d, so from if the mean is 0, okay. So, if mean is 0, then mean square value and the variance are same. So, if the mean is 0, then the mean square value and the variance are same. So, that means 
uh, variance sigma d square is nothing but the mean square value of mean square value of d of n that is d square n and this is equal to expected value of x square n plus x square n minus 1 minus 2 into x of n and x of n minus 1. So, this is expected value of x square n plus expected value of x square n minus 1 minus 2 into expected value of x of n and x of n minus 1. So, x square n is the mean square value of x which is sigma x square. This is also sigma x square because the process is stationary minus 2 into rx of 1 and sigma d square is 1 tenth of sigma x square it is given in the question. So, sigma x square upon 10. So, we have got this. Now, this is sigma x square upon 10 equal to 2 into sigma x square minus 2 into rx of 1. So, this rx of 1 into 2 is equal to 19 upon 20. Okay. Mm, wait a second. 20 minus 1, 19 upon 10. And I have taken 2 also. So, yes, this is what we have. And we wanted to calculate rx of 1 divided by sigma x square. So, it is 0 0.95. Yeah. So, 0 0.95 will be the answer. So, correct answer is option A, 0 0.95. Now solve this question. A real band limited random process x of t has two sided power spectral density as x of f is equal to 10 to the power minus 6, 3000 minus mod f watt per hertz, then mod of f less than 3 kilohertz, then uh, if XT modulates a carrier 16,000 pi T and resultant signal is passed through an ideal bandpass filter with the unity gain and the central frequency 8 kilohertz with the bandwidth 2, then what is the output power? What is the output power? So, here in this question it is given that we have Sx of f which is the power spectral density of input okay, like this and uh, this is Sx of f and it is equal to 10 to the power minus 6 at f equal to 0 it is 3 into 10 to the power 3 into 10 to the power minus 6 and for f equal to 3000 it is 0 so this is 3 kilohertz and minus 3 kilohertz this is power potential so now you are modulating the carrier so how do you modulate the carrier so when we modulate it we know that it is shifted to the frequency of the carrier it is shifted to the frequency of the carrier. It shifted to the frequency of the carrier and amplitude gets divided by 4. 
so previously the amplitude was 3 into 10 to the power 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 so now it is 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 by 4 and it will be 2 into 10 to the power minus 3 by 4 and uh, it would be 1 into 10 to the power minus 3 divided by 4 so it is shifted to 8 okay it is shifted to 8 so this is 11 this is 9 this is 10 this is uh, 7 this is 6 and this is 5 so 5 8 and 11 it will shift at this point here also it is minus 8 minus 5 and minus 11 so when we are passing it through the band pass filter what is that band pass filter band pass filter is having the center frequency 8 and the bandwidth is the gain is 1 the bandwidth is 2 so it is having the center frequency 8 bandwidth is 2 that means this bandwidth is 2 so bandwidth is 2 that means it will be varying from 7 to 9 it will be varying from 7 to 9 okay so this is the band pass filter now when we pass it through the band pass filter you will get the spectrum like this okay so this is the minus 9 minus 8 minus 7 minus uh, sorry plus 7 8 and 9 now this height is 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 divided by 4 and this height is 2 into 10 to the power minus 3 divided by 4 and now we want to calculate the total power so how do you calculate the total power total power is nothing but the area under the curve so total power is area under the curve so this is twice of the area of right hand side this area so that is the 2 into 10 to the power 3 into height is 2 upon 4 into 10 to the power minus 3 plus 1 by 2 base is 10 to the power minus 3 by 4 and uh, this is the base and height uh, height is this and base is 2 into 10 to the power 3 so when we solve it uh, we will get 1 plus 1 by 4 that is 5 by 4 that is 10 by 4 so now it is 2.5 2.5 volt will be the answer okay so for this question 2.5 volt will be the answer so as you all know that there is a mega workshop running there is a mega workshop running and uh, that is for the gate 2024 students from the 15th of january for the uh, gate 24 students and there is a marathon session also there is a marathon session also uh, that is your general aptitude and also the for the mathematics also okay So now let's wait a second.
So come on, tell me once that how many of you are listening now? Because the strength is going down. So do you want to revise the digital communication or not? So let's start the digital communication very quickly so that you know all of you without getting delayed you will finish the complete digital uh, complete communication okay so let's begin the digital communication very quickly we are moving towards the end of our uh, marathon and uh, i'm not bringing it uh, i'm not keeping it to up to the 8 hours okay so we are just quickly finishing up this digital communication so in the digital communication we have the baseband okay we have this baseband and the band pass transmission in the baseband we have pm pw and ppm which is uh, the part of esc and uh, in the digital communication we have to understand the pcm dpcm delta modulation adaptive delta modulation and in the digital modulation technique now next 45 minutes i will finish the digital communication okay satya so in the next 45 minutes we will finish the digital communication also and then we will wind up the marathon okay next 45 minutes and very quickly i will revise it so amplitude shift king phase shift king frequency shift king and the mra phase shift king so in the baseband transmission we directly transmit the signal without modulation so we have the block diagram uh in the pcm in the transmitter side we have the sampler where we perform the sampling then quantization is done then after that we are having the encoder and the line coding so there are uh, multiple regenerative re repeater uh, to you know uh, to generate the fresh signal from the distorted pcm and at the receiver we have the regenerative repeater decoder and reconstruction filter so when uh, we transmit the digital signal so before transmitting the digital signal we first convert it into the uh, discrete time signal and that is done by the sampling theorem according to the sampling theorem if any signal is band limited to fm hertz then we can recover it from its samples if the samples are taken at the rate of fs greater than equal to 2 fm and uh, uh, to sample the signal we multiply the message signal with the sampling function s of t so this is the mt and we sample this message signal with the sampling function s of t when we multiply these two signal we get the sample signal and the fourier transform of this sample signal is given by the fourier transform of the sample signal is given by ms of f is equal to 1 upon fs uh, that is 1 upon ts summation n equal to minus infinite to infinite m of f minus n fs so this is important relation because from there we get the three different case case 1 case 2 case 3 when fs is greater than 2 fm so when we take the fs is greater than 2 fm which is known as over sampling so in this case this particular relation will give you the spectrum the original spectrum for f equal to 0 when you put f equal to 0 you will get m of f divided by ts so similarly when we draw it so yeah when we draw it for n equal to 0 n equal to 0 we will get m of f so this is our m of f and this is known as its replica so this is for n equal to 1 it is the shifted towards fs and for n equal to minus 1 it is shifted towards minus fs and similarly we will get many multiple replica okay so these all are the replica of original signal but when we keep fs equal greater than equal to uh, sorry not equal to when we keep fs greater than 2 fm so that is known as over modulation uh, over sampling yeah so we will take this as a over sampling so when we perform over sampling there is a gap between the uh, original spectrum this is the original spectrum na so this is original spectrum so there is a gap between original spectrum and its replica and that gap is called guard band and value of guard band is fs minus 2 fm when fs is equal to yeah so when we sample any signal when we sample any signal so frequency component that are present in the spectrum of the sample signal in case of single tone modulating signal is fm fs plus minus fm 2 fs plus minus fm 3 fs plus minus fm and so on in the case of over sampling it is possible to recover the original spectrum with the help of practical low pass filter 
now when we keep fs is equal to 2 fm that is known as critical sampling or that is known as nyquist rate also so the nyquist rate that when the fs is exactly 2 fm then original spectrum and its replica just you know ek dusre ko just wo touch karte hain okay they just touch each other and uh, that is why we need an ideal low pass filter to recover it so when we keep the fs is less than 2 fm then we say that it is a under sampling and in this case the aliasing effect will come that the original spectrum and its replica gets overlap and they distort the original message signal so that is why there is under sampling and hence we always want to keep the sampling frequency greater than equal to 2 fm right so there are a few important points then when the message signals are in the summation form so when there is a multitone signal then the sampling frequency is calculated as twice of maximum frequency and when the signals are multiplied in the time domain then uh, we calculate the sampling frequency as twice of summation of the maximum frequency of each component okay so uh, you can see that m1t has the maximum frequency f1 f2 f3 and fn so we have to add all the frequency we have to add all the frequency and then twice it to get the uh, nyquist rate similarly if the signals are convolved in the time domain then to calculate the sampling frequency we calculate the twice of minimum frequency present in the message signals so how do you calculate the uh, yeah nyquist rate for this important signal so suppose the message signal uh, is having the frequency fm okay suppose the message signal mt is band limited to fm if if mt is if mt is band limited to fm if the message signal is band limited to fm then if the mt is band limited to fm then the nyquist state will be twice fm m of minus t will also have twice fm m of t minus t not will also have uh, twice fm so that means it is showing that shifting does not change the nyquist state but when you perform the scaling the nyquist rate is multiplied by a when you perform the scaling the nyquist rate is multiplied by a and this a can be 1 by 2 and it can be means it can be greater than 1 it can be less than 1 so when you perform the uh, minus 80 plus b then also it will only work as a scaling so it will like a scaling and then when you differentiate or integrate the signal the nyquist rate does not change so that is twice of fm so we are not going to solve any questions now yeah now for the band pass sampling for band pass sampling uh, if uh, the sampling frequency is taken in between 2fc plus b divided by m plus 1 and 2 2fc minus b divided by m uh, so that fs is also greater than 2b where uh, this k is m plus 1 and k is known as fh upon b which is you have to calculate only integer part and m shows the number of replica and if suppose fc is very very greater than b then you can take the nyquist rate as a 2 fh that means if they ask you to calculate the nyquist rate then you can calculate 2 fh and if they ask you to calculate the minimum sampling frequency then you can use this formula okay and now coming to the quantization quantize the process in which we divide the amplitude uh, we uh, discretize the, the amplitude and uh, to discretize the amplitude we have a uh, number of levels so we divide into it into the decision boundaries so these dotted lines are decision boundaries and uh, we take one level okay we take levels in between them so these are the levels which we take in between the decision boundaries so whenever the signal lies in that particular level a decision boundaries then we approximate it into that particular level okay then we approximate it into that particular level so this is l1 this is l2 l3 and so on so these are the number of levels so whenever the signal will lie in this range okay suppose the signal will lie in this range then we will approximate it into l1 suppose the signal will lie in this range then we will approximate it into l2 and so on 
so when we quantize there are a few important points that we have to know that is the step size how do you calculate the step size the step size is nothing but the vh minus vl divided by l and what is the quantization error the output of the quantizer and the input message signal so the difference between input and output of the quantizer is uh, quantization error what is the maximum value of quantization error the maximum value of the quantization error is delta by 2 what is the range of quantization error the range of quantization error is minus delta by 2 to delta by 2 now encoding so when we perform when we divide it into number of levels we uh, at the end uh, assign some number of bits so when we assign the number of bit per sample so that is known as n n is the number of bit assigned per sample so n is number of bits per sample and fs is sampling frequency So RB is equal to NFS. Okay, so RB is equal to NFS is the bit rate. RB is equal to NFS is the bit rate. That is very important formula. RB is equal to NFS. Now we calculate the signal to quantization noise ratio. What is the signal to quantization noise ratio? So the noise power is calculated as delta square by 12. Okay, so the noise power. What is the noise power here? The noise power, the quantization noise power is given as delta square by 12. Okay, so quantization noise power is delta square by 12 and signal to quantization noise ratio for sinusoidal signal in dB is 1.76 plus 6n. So that is the signal to quantization noise ratio. Now uh, we know that uh, because of the uh, channel characteristics uh, uh, we have the dispersion relationship and because of that intersymbol interference occurs and to avoid the intersymbol interference we take the uh, pulse uh, which is given by the Nyquist and which has the uh, zero value at the integer multiple of TB. So that is the example of this particular pulse is sync pulse. So when we perform the sync pulse and uh, it, we have the finite bandwidth. So for the sync pulse, okay, for sync pulse, we get the bandwidth of the PCM signal is equal to RB by 2. And for race cosine, okay, for race cosine, for uh, raised cosine pulse, we have the bandwidth is equal to RB by 2, 1 plus alpha, okay. And there is a rectangular pulse, then with the bandwidth is RB. So, yeah, our questions we are not going to solve. Now, the delta modulation. The delta modulation is nothing but the spatial version of DPCM. And in the delta modulation, there are three things which is very important to remember. First is what is the error. So the error in the delta modulations are granular noise and the slope overload. How uh, the slope overload occurs when the step size is too high. When the step size is too high. When the step size is too high. Yes, here. When the step size is too. When the slope of the message signal is too large. When the slope of the message signal is too large, then it is called a slope overload. Okay, when the slope of the message signal is too large then it is called slope overload and when the uh, slope of message signal is almost constant then it is called the granular noise okay so it is called the granular noise where the message signal has the constant slope and the slope of the staircase is high then it is known as when the step size is too small relative to the slope of message signal then we have the slope overload error and when the step size is small that it cannot follow the slope of the message signal and that cause the hunting around the flat segment of the input waveform so that is known as granular noise and to avoid the granular noise oh sorry to avoid the slope overload error because it is more important so to avoid the slope overload error the slope of the slope of staircase the slope of staircase should be greater than or equal to 
the magnitude of slope of method signal okay magnitude of slope of method signal so what are the quantization error so to avoid if the method signal is am sin omega mt okay when the what is the maximum quantization error what is the maximum quantization error the maximum quantization error is plus minus delta the maximum quantization error is plus minus delta here and what is the quantization noise power the quantization noise power is delta is square upon 3 the maximum quantization error is delta is square upon 3 right so this is uh, delta is square upon 3 maximum quantization error is delta and if the method signal is am sin omega mt so to how to avoid the condition to avoid slope overload so the condition to avoid slope overload is slope of staircase should be greater than equal to slope of message signal so what is the slope of message signal d by dt of mt and its magnitude so this is delta into fs and greater than equal to maximum value of d by dt that is am into omega m so am into omega m so what is the amplitude amplitude should be less than equal to delta into fs upon 2 pi into fm so this will be the amplitude of message signal okay this will be the amplitude of what message signal so whenever you use the delta modulation the amplitude of the message signal should be less than equal to delta fs upon 2 pi fm okay so signal to quantization noise power you can calculate and uh, I will tell you pre filter and before filter okay uh, that is pre filter and post filter so signal to quantization noise ratio pre filtered okay this is pre filtered is equal to 3 upon 8 pi square and uh, this is fs upon fm whole square and uh, post filter this is sqnr post filter Okay, this is SQNR post filter. This is 3 upon 8 pi square Fs cube upon Fc into Fm square. So, this is the post filter and the pre filter SQNR. So, that you can note it down. Okay, so this is how you can write. You can note it down here. So if I move this side, then you will be able to see that formula. Yeah. So after that, uh, we have the signal to condensation modulation and delta modulation. So there were few questions. Uh, now band pass modulation. In the band pass modulation, we have three type of modulation technique, which is ASK, PSK, and FSK. In the amplitude shift keying, uh, uh, whenever the binary one will come. So whenever the binary 1 will come, we will transmit the signal and when the binary 0 will come, we will not transmit the signal and uh, this is on and this is off. So we say that as a on off signal and in case of PSK, in case of PSK, whenever the binary 1 will come, we will transmit the same carrier signal but whenever the 0 will come, we will transmit the signal after 180 degree phase shift and in case of FSK, Whenever binary 1 will come, we will transmit the high frequency and whenever the binary 0 will come, we will transmit the low frequency. So that is the definition of the binary uh, amplitude shift king, phase shift king and the frequency shift king. So there are only few things which are important which is nothing but a block diagram. So uh, not block diagram, bandwidth. So bandwidth is uh, 2 RB in case of amplitude shift king and uh, when you use the raise cosine pulse, then the bandwidth uh, will become when the bandwidth will become when you uh, bandwidth will become rb okay that is the minimum bandwidth instead of using the rectangular pulse if you use the sync pulse to avoid the raised cosine pulse then the bandwidth of ask is rb similarly uh, how do we get this particular bandwidth rb by just replacing replace the rb by rb by 2 1 plus alpha so we have got the bandwidth of uh, ask as 2 rb so if you replace this rb as rb by 2 1 plus alpha then this 2 and 2 will get cancelled and you will get rb 1 plus alpha and if you want to calculate the minimum bandwidth so minimum bandwidth alpha is 0 alpha is 0 for minimum bandwidth 
so that will become bandwidth minimum is nothing but your rb so that is what we have written here minimum theoretical bandwidth is rb now this is the constellation diagram and uh, both the symbols will lie in the different circles in case of the ask signal Okay, and in case of PSK, as we know, by for binary one we transmit the same carrier signal. For binary zero, we transmit the signal with 180 degree phase shift. And uh, the bandwidth is again important. The bandwidth is 2 RB here. Here also the bandwidth is 2 RB if you transmit the rectangular pulse. And again, if you want to use the raised cosine pulse, replace RB by RB by 2 1 plus alpha, then you will get the minimum theoretical bandwidth as RB. The constellation diagram is the, also important over here. The two symbols is these two and both the symbols will lie on the same circle and one important thing about this uh, constellation diagram is the minimum distance. The minimum distance in case of this is 2 root over EB and uh, you should know that the probability of error should always be inversely proportional to the minimum distance. Okay, so whenever you want to compare the two constellation diagram, then just calculate the minimum distance in all both the constellation diagram and compare its probability of error. The constellation diagram which has the largest minimum distance will have the minimum probability of error. So M array PSK, uh, this is M equal to 2 to the power N and N is equal to log base to M. You can say and for M array PSK, the important thing is bandwidth. Bandwidth is 2 RB upon log base 2 M. And you can also calculate the spectrum efficiency, which is bit rate upon bandwidth. Now coming to the FSK. Okay, so let me see once uh, again. Okay, so the PDF you want to uh, you want to get now. The PDF uh, you will not be able to get here. The PDF you can get from the Telegram group. Okay, so I will share the uh, you know in the description or in the comments uh, pin. Also, there is a Telegram group, so you can join the Telegram group. And uh, there you will get all the PPTs. So actually, uh, this is it for the today's session. And we have covered the entire syllabus. Uh, just the noise in the digital communication is left. So only one topic which we have left. So don't forget to subscribe the channel. And uh, we will, you know, uh, you know, we will get the uh, information theory and the noise in digital communication in the form of a questions. So. Let's meet in the next session and I hope that this analog communication part and the random variable are very useful for you. In the digital communication, I have covered only PCM part because the I think I missed the PPTs of the noise in digital communication and the information theory. So no problem, uh, we will cover the noise in digital communication and the uh, information theory through the questions. Okay, so thank you for watching this session and it was a very long session. 
and i will provide the pdf in the uh, telegram group which is given in the description and also in the pin section thank you